Good morning. We are calling to order Commission Meeting Number 283 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on Thursday, December 5th, 2019 at 10 a.m. at our offices here at 101 Federal Street in Boston. Um, as you can see, today we are missing Commissioner Zuniga, who is under the weather. We'll proceed with all of our, our matters and, um, uh, as always, we'll reserve for him the opportunity to address any of them at a, a later Commission um, meeting. Um, before we uh, begin with Commissioner Stebbins, who is at my immediate left today, um, I want to note that we have changed the order of today's agenda. After item five, which um, Mr. Grossman will address um, a matter, we will take up the racing division items that were originally set forth in item number nine. So. Uh, we're just going to move that item up, and then we'll move back to uh, the IEB, which is um, under item number, originally item number six, now item number seven. Commissioner Stebbins. Good morning, Madam Chair. Um, in your packet, you have the minutes of the November 21st, 2019 meeting. I would move their approval, always subject to correction for any typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Second. Any comments or suggestions? I, I do have a couple that I mm -hmm. would just like to go over. Um, Shara, I'm not sure if uh, I have the facts straight, but we might want to supplement a uh, couple of items under on page five at the top 1109 a.m. entry I'm wondering I I might be wrong I thought that the fiscal years were 18 and 19 um, and I, I wondered if we could include uh, Mr. Mathis's report if my memory is correct he said and it might be 30 percent but it might have been 35 percent that the, I don't know if you remember, Ed, that the accommodations and meal taxes had gone up in the, uh, from 18 to 19. And he uh, reported that he believed that 50 percent of that would have been attributed to MGM Springfield. The point was that he was pointing out they hadn't cannibalized, and that that was an important uh, fact. And we've asked um, our facilities to start to track those t local taxes. So if we could add that in, please, if we agree. Mm -hmm. And then oh, I think we're going to get clarity on page 8 uh, with respect to the report that I had asked for. So I think we'll be all set. I think that's all I have, Commissioner Stebbins. Okay. Shara and I can go back and look at the look at Mike's presentation and, uh, and add those figures because I agree with you. It's important and something that we've uh, been trying to keep an eye on to see what the impact of our casinos have had on the, the local hotels and other local restaurants. Well, the only, I do have another one. I'm sorry. It's okay. Am I on the bottom of page 7? The chair then asked if Commissioner Zuniga would look into, this is on the uh, staffing issue of the troopers, I believe I, it would have been Commissioner Cameron that I asked rather than Commissioner Zuniga. Uh, on the bottom of page 7 at 12.55 p.m. entry. Commissioner Cameron, do you remember that? I think yes, I do. Okay. Mm -hmm. I might have said Zuniga erroneously, but it would have been Commissioner Cameron. You were thinking about the money. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Okay. That's all okay. I have. Thank you. Great. So we have a motion and a second. Um, <clears throat> perhaps we could, how would we do this? We'd have to um, agree. Oh, we've agreed to the um, edits and mm -hmm. the amendment. Yes. Mm -hmm. Second yep. with the amendment. Okay. So, and I'm not sure if that's actually procedurally correct, but. It will reflect that edit. I think Commissioner Stebbins always makes that statement at the beginning, uh, subject to uh, technical corrections. This is more really, you know, it's typographical, right? non-material matters. Yes. I don't think this right. changes any right. of the essence. We're just adding to it and 
okay. making your correction. Great, thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 4-0, thank you. Moving on to item number three, we have guests this morning to start us off from VeraCloud. Derek, would you like to introduce this? Yes. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. I'm joined today by Doug Brutnick and Todd Bida from VeraCloud, and we're here to give a presentation on the efforts of the MGC Supplier Diversity Program. As you're aware, um, we work diligently and we ask our licensees to work diligently on diversity and inclusion. VeraCloud is a company that is built um, helping agencies and other entities attain these goals. Um, I can say that it's been a pleasure working with the, with the company. Um, they have helped our program at length, and at this point, I don't want to take any of their thunder, so I'll let them um, <laughs> walk through their presentation. Thank you, Derek. Madam Chair, Commissioners, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today, and thank you very much for the opportunity to serve the Commission and the Commonwealth. At VeraCloud, we're extremely passionate about the mission that you have, which is similar to our mission, which is your commitment to diversity in both your uh, worker and supplier base. VeraCloud is focused on uh, bringing uh, diversity, access, and inclusion to the public sector contracting market. And uh, we are a Boston-based company. And today, we're here to talk about the results of our work here over the last uh, three years or so with the commission, uh, why we are here. Uh, since 2017, uh, when we started working with VeraCloud, uh, after we were accepted into the Massachusetts OSD IT Small Business Incubator Pilot, we were uh, grateful to be um, hired by the Commission to uh, begin the process of helping you uh, further address and further succeed in your diversity and inclusion goals. Uh, we serve the MGC mission as we serve as we serve those diverse businesses in the Commonwealth, and we activate, engage, activate. Uh, diverse vendor marketplaces and diverse uh, companies within those marketplaces on behalf of the Commission for participation in MGC opportunities, uh, creating access and opportunity for everyone above and beyond uh, the tremendous commitments that you have to, to, the, to diversity in the Commonwealth. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, our founder, uh, Doug Rutnick, to talk about what we do and, how, and specifics on the impact that we've had for the Commission in the Commonwealth. Great. Well, thank you again, uh, Madam Commissioner. Commissioners. Uh, okay, why we're here. Um, <clears throat> are we? Okay, well, I'm going to talk about what we do. Okay, we're, we're experts in procurement optimization. Um, we do this in real time during the open periods of procurements for the Commission. Uh, we optimize these procurements to ensure that the diverse vendors and the marketplaces are made aware of these opportunities. Um, we also provide support to those vendors because a lot of them are first-time um, bidders and combis or first-time um, government contractors. Uh, we do everything uh, with thoroughly documented efforts, uh, and we have uh, an amazing positive impact that, that tends to be lasting, and I'll, I'll go over that on a couple of future slides. Um, we just increase awareness. We recruit stronger participation, um, more bids, lower costs, better value, and uh, just a more effective means by which to address inclusion goals. <clears throat> why it works. Um, it's really interesting why it works. Why it works is because we found a way to work directly with the commission uh, and not impact them in any negative manners. We have no incremental demands on their personnel. There's no changes to any existing technologies or procedures that the Commission has. And there's no changes to process. So what we do is, is basically an overlay onto business as usual in the Commission. And we ensure that these marketplaces are uh, made aware, supported, and participatory in any opportunity that comes through the Commission. Um, some success with MGC. So we've done a lot of these procurements at MGC, and I'll just go over one of them in particular. Um, this was a travel services solicitation looking for um, an agency to help book travel for the uh, commission to, to go about their business. So on this particular um, procurement in 2018, we found out that the marketplace uh, was pretty extensive. So we increased by 12 times the number of diverse vendors that were actually 
uh, aware of this opportunity and got them to take a look at it. Uh, nine of them um, participated in the RFR in some means, whether it was asking questions. Uh, we had five new Combi's accounts created from this. So five first time Combi's users from this, this one effort. And uh, four times the number of bids from the previous solicitation. And uh, we ended up uh, recruiting this uh, company, uh, I think it was Travel Eaters of uh, Farmingham, a WBE. They had been certified since 2009 and then they'd never done business with the Commonwealth. So it's not like they were um, a, a new business. This is an established company that had been around and part of the program. Uh, this was their first ever contract with the Commonwealth. So we found that you know, quite telling that the businesses are out there. They just need a little bit of support and a little bit of um, technology to keep them informed about what's happening. And that's the part that, that we provide. And then we provide, uh, we create this avenue for direct feedback. And I, I'll go more into that on, on another slide. But the feedback is invaluable in helping the commission actually um, inform future procurements and shape policy and strategy on engaging diverse vendors. Uh, if you don't know the capabilities of a marketplace or their capacity, it's really hard to, to interact with them and expect to get participation. So this feedback channel has been really amazing. We'll talk about uh, another success with MGC with some work with Plain Ridge Park Casino. Um, Plain Ridge was, you know, looking to engage veteran vendors. Uh, they were struggling in that area, and they, um, they basically, uh, the, the commission said, "Hey, can you can you see what you can do? See if there's any way we can help Plain Ridge." So, on one of their opportunities, we first looked at their uh, upcoming procurements, and they had a uh, high limits gaming lounge. Um, we were able to find uh, a marketplace of, I think there were 20 or so uh, veteran contracting companies. Uh, Plain Ridge hadn't been able to find any, so we got 20. Um, we also, as a result, we got 13 veteran contractors requesting site visits, documents, and submitting bids. Um, we thought that was a, a tremendous success for Plain Ridge, and that they went from zero to um, the head of uh, Diversity of Plain Ridge saying, you know, my mailbox is full of people interested in this opportunity. This is a fantastic problem to have. Um, that was another great success for us. Uh, <clears throat> and then success, another success story is uh, cultivating marketplaces for future RFPs. Um, this was a really interesting, um, another project we did with the Mass Gaming Commission. Uh, this was for promotional items. Um, it was an enormous marketplace. There were 78 vendors in it. Um, we had all kinds of feedback and interest uh, from these vendors. Uh, 17 minority, 58 women, uh, 4 veteran, uh, 16 disadvantaged, 3 disability business enterprises. Um, this was a great example. Um, we ended up cultivating this huge marketplace. We got a lot of positive feedback from these, and the commission ended up um, hiring a WBE off of a statewide contract that uh, that ended up, you know, winning this solicitation. It it was part of our recruiting, but it was an incumbent. So we have positive results, whether or not a new vendor is selected or not. The activation of the marketplace has absolute lasting results. Are you able to um, share that? marketplace with other state agencies do you are you working with OSD or other state agencies so that you know because this is a, this was a um, an RFP for promotional items so something that is generally sought after yeah. by so many state agencies because this is quite a collection yeah no we, we would love to do business with OSD down the road and, and have a, a lot of great initiatives uh, lined up that would be Fantastic. Um, perhaps uh, optimizing statewide contracts for diverse inclusion. I don't think anyone has ever taken a look at the statewide contracts available to all the agencies, found out whether or not there were diverse vendors and whether or not there's any way to tell their diverse vendors on those you can't contracts. Tell that on Convoy. Yeah, yeah and we would love to do that and, and ensure that these statewide contracts are loaded with diverse vendors. It would be a 
yeah, so, a, a so great this, initiative. This is one of the areas that Doug and um, Todd have really helped us. Their data mining efforts mm -hmm. are tremendous. They get people registered as diverse firms that weren't registered before. Um, they find people who are on contracts that ha are capable of performing services, but they may just not have signed up for those services. Um, so their, their ability to, to dig into the data and at a really reasonable cost has provided a lot of these outcomes. So if you look on the statewide contract that this person um, that we um, hired for promote this company we hired for pro promotional um, items came off of, they wouldn't look like they could provide promotional items because they had just signed up for one separate sure. NAICS code. They dug into their business after looking and cross-referencing and yeah. saying, hey, you guys are diverse. This opportunity is out there. You probably didn't get notified because Combi works all off of NAICS code when it comes to noti um, notifying people. And they said, hey, why don't you apply to this or take a look at this one? And this is what they've done for a lot of our, um, a lot of our work. And we have tried to get them to um, in contact with OSD. And OSD said, well, why don't you work with the commission for a while and let's see how your results come up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Good. <clears throat> Thank you, Todd. Um, another success with MGC came out of a procurement we just optimized this fall. Um, it was a solicitation. Um, what was the solicitation? Gaming research. Yeah. So it was a gaming research solicitation in September. Um, in the middle of our uh, activation of this marketplace, we started getting feedback in real time during the open. Um, period of this procurement, some of the feedback was really interesting and, and we were able to take that feedback directly back to the commission. Um, and there were 11 diverse vendors that had, well, there was a handful initially that expressed interest in doing a portion of this RFR. Um, I thought about that and I said, if there's a handful that are interested, I bet you there's a, a lot more that just didn't bother to say anything that might be interested in doing a portion of the RFR. Uh, the Commission allowed us to go back into this RFR, pull this marketplace again, and found out that there were 11 diverse vin vendors interested in doing a portion of this RFR. So in essence, we were able to unlock this RFR for potential teaming and partnerships. Uh, we submitted this vendor marketplace to the Commission. They actually added it to the RFP, um, and it enabled uh, even prime contractors to find diverse vendor partners as part of this bid, and this was all done in real time during the open period of this RFP. So this, this was an amazing innovation for us, an amazing result, because it taught us that the larger opportunities with the Mass Gaming Commission may need to be unbundled or can be unbundled for diverse participation and, and the ability to access these marketplaces so that a prime contractor could utilize one of these vendors in real time was quite a breakthrough for us. I mean, it was, it was absolutely amazing and I think the just to reinforce the breakthrough for us came as Derek enabled us to be able to reach back out to the community and then in real time uh, amended uh, the process to be able to include um, we can't tell you over the years how many times we've heard let's try it next time let's try it next yeah. time yeah there was no trying next time next time was too far away and Derek stepped in and, and made that change it. immediately and we did it and for immediate positive impact for the common for the Commission and the Commonwealth so uh, kudos and thank you to Derek yeah, and, and this was a this was one of those areas where um, it was a really good idea coming from good feedback that we normally wouldn't have received. Um, so having having Veracloud here really assisted us um, because the contract manager wanted one prime, wanted one person to head up the research, um, and with that comes their group of people they're used to working with and some of them may not be diverse, by having a list of 11 diverse vendors who are interested in doing a piece of it, it made it very easy for us to look at someone across the table who's saying, I can't find a diverse vendor or a diverse partner and say, well, then you're really going to get a zero on that piece of the scoring because we've got a list of 11 right here you could be using that have showed an interest and in, say they can do a piece of this work. So it was, it was very impactful. It, um, it's something we'd like to do going forward. Um, especially when, you know, someone said we want one prime, but there's multiple components that we can say, hey, are there people interested in doing this? And if so, we'll update the list um, in the future with potential partners you could partner with on this. 
And, and it wasn't a subcontract. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Kim. You first. Go ahead. Uh, it wasn't. Was it a subcontracting arrangement, or was it joint uh, joint partnership? And you know, it really bringing the the diverse uh, it, uh, it, company to the table. It was however they wanted to do it. Two diverse vendors could have partnered with one another yeah. from that list. That was an initial theory, as well as prime contractors selecting one of those to okay. partner with them and team on the actual bid submission. So it was it, it was a, a level of inclusiveness that did not exist before the procurement started and it was one we were able to open up yeah. in the middle of the procurement and it's going to inform um, how we do future large procurements with yeah. the commission. That, that's really smart. Yeah, it, amazing. D does your system track results? I know that a big piece <coughs> of this is getting the diverse vendors to the table. I understand clearly. But do you also track where they may not have been successful in order to help them we the do. next time? We do. We, we, we provide an open feedback channel that actually has been utilized in the past. I talked about that travel services RFR we did in 2018. About four months after that, we got a phone call from a travel service vendor that we had identified and recruited that said, hey, I'm trying to bid on this thing for um, the building commission or some other commission in, in the Commonwealth and the RFP disappeared from combines. Can you help us out with that? I was absolutely thrilled, one, that they looked, on it, uh, looked at us as a resource, but also that that's a lasting impact. Here is someone that we had recruited that didn't win the award, but was actively pursuing new business with the Commonwealth. They went from isolated and unaware to an actively engaged and vibrant company. We were, we're making these marketplaces more vibrant and we're teaching um, prospective vendors about opportunity and future opportunity. So that and was I, yeah, wasn't your point that perhaps those that strug uh, struggle, yeah. do you provide capacity building assistance after that? We do. We help them. We help them um, with combines accounts. We help them through any aspect of the procurement and answer any questions that they might have. So, is there a way to help them understand why they may not have been competitive with that particular bid, <laughs> so that they can improve the next? And we've time? done that. We've we've actually sent. Uh, because combines is such a, it's a pretty thorough system. The scoring reports are posted to combines after an RFP. We've actually forwarded scoring reports back to people that we've recruited to show them here's where you may have fallen short. And, and part of that we've provided feedback to the commission is that we have diverse vendors that score zero on diversity, which is a problem with the rules, but it's, Again, if you didn't know about these things, you would not be able to change them in the future. But it's kind of, you know, a <laughs> your, your diversity status working against you. If you bid on something and get no credit for diversity in the RFP, even though you're a diverse vendor, it's Why kind of counterintuitive. And that, <clears throat> well, it's just, it's just I think the way one the of the are. one of the one of the problems with the well, it's actually you know, it's through our constitution, but. Uh, the um, a diverse company still must, under our rules in Massachusetts, must supply a must gain a uh, and, and actually record a supplier diversity partner, and so often a diverse applicant won't think that applies to them, so they leave it blank, and then they end up getting zero points. If they there needs to be clarity around that. It's like, you know, WBEs will say, "Hey, I'm a, I'm a WBE. I don't need to fill that up." But they still need to get a um, yeah. a, 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 a diverse partner through the supply chain. Mm -hmm. I see. It's a it's hopefully they're correcting that uh, yeah. with yeah. their forms because it's an but something that does happen. But access to the feedback is invaluable. I mean, it's it's yeah. incredible to be able to to help these marketplaces. Uh, grow and thrive and, and, yeah. and we, we see it. I mean, it's amazing. Excellent. And that's, and that's what Doug and Todd have helped us with some of our scoring by saying, hey, they are a diverse firm. Um, <laughs> they might not have the certification. They're working through it right now to get it, but they're a diverse firm, so we can give them the scoring points. Mm -hmm. We've received actual requests from these, um, from these uh, solicitations of firms to come in and get a debrief on where they may have broken down. Now, we can't compare. As you're well aware, we can't compare them to other scores. We can't no. say, but we can say this is where you may have fallen a little short. Mm -hmm. um, just That's to give really them, critical piece yeah, of the yeah. yeah. 
And we try to we try to be very transparent mm -hmm. um, on our scoring criteria and be mm -hmm. upfront with it and give as much information as possible, which is some of the feedback we got on early procurements. Giving more details around what your scoring will be allows us to write a better application. Mm -hmm. um, so we've we've tried to really use the feedback that Doug and Todd have received to make this a better procurement process, as well as the, I mean, the activation that they've gotten from the community and the lists that were already out there that OSD already had created and the certifications that were out there to just apply them to our specific procurement would have taken us an additional one or two people mm -hmm. and we get to pay just for that one engagement um, so the value feedback and uh, the minimal costs that, that they are to us is is and the results they've given us are are amazing and we have a lot of work to continue to do um, as we've reported to you. That's why we went out and engaged Todd and Doug. Um, we still have a lot of work to do to focus, and you know that's some of the stuff Doug and Todd are talking about, unbundling our statewide yep. contracts, mm -hmm. yep. using them as a, wherever some of our prime contractors are willing, using them as a resource to them to say, hey, sit down, go through your budget, figure out where you have some um, capacity to do some discretionary spending and see if they can find you some vendors. Um, you know, that takes a lot of opening the doors with our prime vendors and them being willing to, to do it, but if, they, if that's ingrained in them like it is in PPC, they'll welcome it. When we offered this to PPC, um, they asked if they could have them for more engagements. We just ran out of money <laughs> that year, um, so. Hmm. So, yeah. So um, I guess next up, um, uh, this is a, about the statewide contracts. We touched on this a little earlier, is, is uh, unlocking um, these statewide contracts. And that's, uh, it's really a three-part process for us, is uh, researching the approved vendors to find out which ones are capable of uh, satisfying the demands of the contracts, um, identifying um, the marketplaces uh, comparing the marketplace with the authorized statewide contract list, finding out the delta, are there any diverse vendors on there? And then, um, you know, a, a campaign to, to basically include these vendors and, and help them get on statewide contract. I'm not sure of the process, but it's, it's certainly something that we're willing to do to help these vendors get on these contracts so that when the commission goes to buy something off contract, they know exactly who's diverse on that. And if there wasn't anybody before, we'd optimize that contract for uh, diversity inclusion. So uh, part of the part of the beauty of being in the Commonwealth is the power of the combines platform and the power of the statewide contract process. And we saw the opportunity years ago when we founded the company to create well lit pathways to these tremendous resources in the Commonwealth to be able to illuminate uh, a clear path forward for vendors who are focused on their primary business of doing their business. They're not they're, if they're painters, they're painters. They're not focused on the process of navigating a large, complex tools that are that are come by in the statewide contract contract process. So we found that there's a tremendous opportunity to create, again, create these pathways for these for these underserved populations to be able to continue to raise their hand. And we found, as we've des described today with some of these uh, case studies, the amazing power of even one opportunity, just just. Being, uh, being recognized as a potential vendor and then as a, as a uh, diverse vendor, then knowing that there are more opportunities, uh, like you said, Madam Chair, across other agencies as well. Yeah. It's not just uh, promotional items don't just exist at the Gaming Commission. They are across all of the state agencies. So now those vendors know, my gosh, in addition to my regular promotional business, there is a marketplace out there. And by training those vendors, so to speak, to um, access the power of combines and access the power of statewide contracts. We create a lasting impact in the in the in the Commonwealth, and a lasting impact in these communities and the and the families and the and the other businesses that they serve. Creating a, uh, you know, a rising tide raises all ships approach uh, to uh, these diverse communities. So, thank you. Well, I would just add and say you know appreciate the work you've done for. Derek and his team and on behalf of the commission and you know Doug we had a chance to meet a long time ago you were persistent in showing up at our access and opportunity committee meetings and that helped you one not only get in front of our 
licensees, but also eventually in front of us. So I thank you for that persistence because it's had some results not only for us, but in, in, uh, in the case of Plain Ridge, they've been able to utilize you as well. So thank you for your good work. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And what it means to you. Um, greater diversity and inclusion. We've talked a lot about these different opportunities and the impacts we've been able to have and the feedback from the vendor marketplaces. And uh, what we haven't mentioned is the validation that the vendors feel when someone reaches out to them. They're like, oh my gosh, this is great. No one's ever done this before. These are a lot of first time users and um, they need that little jump start to get into the Combi system. And, and Combi is very mechanical. It's, it's based on codes. The solicitations that go out for people have a lot of overlap, and we found a lot of vendors tend to ignore them over time because they're not a fit. And what we've been able to achieve here is we create no noise in the marketplace when we go out to people. It's a direct fit, and there's relevance, and we try to humbly relate to them, and we try and support them, and we ask. It, there's a whole behavioral science component to reaching people and getting them evolve, uh, involved and getting them to to provide feedback and, and interact. Um, and it's, it's that extra bit that's really making, making the difference. And, and the, you know, as far as the commission goes, you're, you're, you're touching all these vendors. You, you, you have this uh, mission of being inclusive and diverse. And now everything that runs through this commission, it, it touches the marketplace. It actually touches everyone in the marketplace. So we strive for this 100% this inclusiveness, meaning when the, when the opportunity goes public, we ensure that that marketplace, every vendor, and we, we jump through a lot of hoops with the databases to ensure that we find every vendor. We search even blank data fields because some people don't put a code in. Some people, when, they, when they've done their certification, just fail to realize the importance of a robust description of having as many codes for the services that you provide. And I, I could, code stories are very funny. There's um, uh, a typical one is snow plowers. A lot of these people needed someone to plow for snow. Now there's a NAICS code for snow plowing. But most people that plow snow are in property management and landscape. That's a different code. Now to get, get a really interactive piece of that marketplace, you have to go after the property maintenance and landscapers, not necessarily snow plowing. Snow plowing will have a few people that that's all they do is plow snow. but you're missing two thirds of the marketplace. So these are the, the, the types of things that we've been able to do for the commission and, and um, it's just had a transformative uh, result. I mean, it's, it's, it's been really, really amazing. And we'd just like to reinforce that the only reason why we're able to do this is because of the starting with the diversity commitment of the commission. Uh, were it not for your solid commitment to this marketplace, to creating diversity, access, and inclusion, we wouldn't be able to sit here today. We wouldn't have been able to serve the commission or work with Derek and serve him and his, his leadership over the last three years now. Um, it's, and it's not, um, um, it's, it's not to be underestimated the power of that commitment as a, as a leader in the marketplace. And uh, when we spoke with OSD years ago and it was, you know, See what, Matt, see what happens with, with MGC. It was a valuable opportunity for us as a company. It's also a valuable opportunity for those diverse vendors in the marketplace to recognize your leadership. So thank you. And then just to, sorry, just to, just to really wrap up and, 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 and confirm, we, we, work with, we work with all sides of the marketplace. We're trying to create new sides of the marketplace and new, and new, new opportunities for both public and private sector vendors agencies, um, governmentals, to be able to work together in ways that um, are intended by mission statements and are able to be able to deliver results in ways that are previously not possible. And uh, we are grateful through our uh, procurement optimization programs and our diversity works programs to be able to find ways with innovators like Derek and with the commission to be able to constantly provide incremental value and deliver incremental powerful impact and results uh, on diversity uh, missions like yours. And we're grateful for the opportunity to serve the commission, grateful for the opportunity to serve the Commonwealth and the diverse vendors of the Commonwealth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioners, for the opportunity to be here today as well. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. Thank you. Great service, and uh, I hope uh, many others take you up on this, um, this niche that you saw a need for, and it's so necessary and helpful.
Commissioner O'Brien. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Just, Thank you so much. Excellent. Thanks. Just one thing I want to say. I keep getting the credit, but it really is Agnes that does the majority of the work with, mm -hmm. um, with Doug and Todd. And it's the managers who actually bring forward the procurements and are willing to, because um, this takes extra time, right? Um, it builds in time to each procurement. And they're willing to go with us down this path. And that speaks volumes to the message the commission um, has, has given to staff, that this is a vital part of the act, a vital part of our community, and vital part of the commission's more. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Well, Derek, you're always good at, at making sure you share credit with your team. When we, Agnes is out today, we are thinking of her and know that she's a vital partner for you and for our entire team. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. Moving on to um, Item number four, our administrative update. You have two parts today, Ed. I do. And you know, I'm going to actually ask Derek to hang around. Um, so I will start with the administrative update. Um, as you know, and I mentioned last time, uh, the racing season is over. Uh, Commissioner Stebbins, Zunaga, and I went down um, after the last meeting and had lunch with our seasonal racing staff to thank them. Um, I think they were probably more appreciative to see pizza than us, but <laughs> they got to see us and we thank them and they do a, a, a wonderful job and we're very fortunate to have them. So, um, that, uh, so again, thank you to that staff. Uh, Chair, you had mentioned this in your amendment to some of the minutes, but I did want to report back on some of the um, GEU staffing and overtime issues. Um, we've had a number of meetings on those actually this week, and I'm fortunate that we have a lot of law enforcement experience on the commission to help uh, meeting with Detective Lieutenant Connors on um, staffing issues and risks and what overtime is being used for, which leads me to the second issue, which is just a clarification on some of the overtime costs, um, which Detective, Con Detective Lieutenant Connors helped us understand. Um, much like happens in other areas of Boston, there's a nightclub in, in um, Encore called Memoir. It is staffed on weekend nights with um, some uh, additional police officers, whether they're state troopers or local officers. There's a switch. Those are what is called in the vernacular detail officers. Those are folks who are not associated with the GEU, who come from the state police troop in that area or Everett police officers, and they are paid directly by Big Night Entertainment, the nightclub operator. So that is not a cost to us. That, and that is similar to what they do in their clubs in Boston and everywhere else. So just to, to clarify that. However, um, there is, there has been um, since opening a request uh, by Encore on certain nights, usually weekend nights or holidays, for enhanced GEU presence. Um, and sometimes they will want those folks in uniforms as opposed to the, uh, the I don't want to say dress down, but the less formal GEU attire. Um, those items, that those uh, billing items are going to be absorbed directly by Encore. That was a direct assholes would be. So there is a little bit of um, um, clarification we will do in the overtime budget. And we are also working on the staffing issues um, with Detective Lieutenant Connors. So I think that that clarifies. Uh, I had that understanding. And I, and I think, Derek, in your last report, there was a little bit of ambiguity. So I think that's clear. Is that correct now? That's correct. OK, good. Right. So. Excellent. And then, and I think we'll hear more on the staffing yep. later date. Absolutely. So thank you. Uh, thank the you. other thing I would, and Derek is here, but I just wanted to tell you, Derek and his folks are over at Encore this week doing our uh, statutory audit, which will be a little bit abbreviated because it's obviously a half year in a startup mode. Um, but they still, there's a statutory requirement, and they're over, they're over doing that. So thank you, Derek, and your folks. Um, and also, I want to uh, give a shout out to um, our um, Gaming agents, despite the weather, we were fully staffed at all the casinos during during the weather. So that's, as we all know, uh, was not an unchallenging uh, commute in weather time. So thank you to those folks um, for keeping our facilities well staffed. So that is, before I get into item B, that is my administrative update. I don't know if anyone has any questions on that. Okay, great, thank thanks. 
All right, so let's get into item B, which is the potential questions um, concerning a potential RFI. And what I'd like to do is try and um, break this down into two processes. Um, so as you um, well know, the commission has considered what, if any, information it needs to help evaluate the future of Region C. In our previous meetings, you had potentially discussed seeking either public and or expert um, opinion on a number of issues related to Region C. What we're attempting to do here is provide a framework for the beginning of that discussion. And I'd like to suggest there are two related issues. One is process and one is substance. In terms of process, um, the Commission has a number of tools available to it. Um, first, it has an RFI, which is the, the, an acronym for Request for Information. And I, this is one of the reasons I have Derek here. He is a little more um, proficient in this area. But an RFI um, presupposes but not requires a subsequent procurement process. An RFI is a way to help clarify a subsequent procurement process. Um, Public comment, as you know, is public comment is, is, is I don't want to say, I don't want to diminish what it is. It is a different vehicle. And, and actually, Derek made a good point. Uh, this commission is uniquely situated maybe from other public bodies because of these meetings, because of our transparency. You do have an ability to do public comments, I think, in a way other bodies may not get responses for just putting out public comments. Now, um, I also understand RFI and public comment are not mutually exclusive. That is something that could be combined. An RFI process is something that goes through combines, which as you just heard about, um, which may um, tend to um, get different types of responses than maybe just a, a public comment response. So that is something to think about. Um, the other issue, process and substance, the, the substance is obviously you will see the um, the questions, um, the sort of areas of questions I have proposed: market study, um, impact on Regency, and potential potential mitigation in Regency, um, are things you might want to think about. What is the type of information, whether it's through an RFI or public comment, that is most valuable to you as you think about going forward? Um, I just wanted to take uh, one more minute and just remind you of some of the statutory criteria that are in either the Expanded uh, Gaming Act or uh, 23K that uh, could potentially influence your thoughts. Um, in Section 1, which is the enabling section of 23K, uh, Section 2 talks about establishing uh, this is the general court talking about why they passed expanded gaming. In section two, it talks about establishing the financial stability and integrity of gaming licenses, as well the integrity of their source of financing is an integral and essential element of the regulation control of gaming under this chapter. Um, in section four of 23K, which is the powers of the commission, um, section 12 talks about um, developed criteria to assess which applications for gaming license will provide the highest and best value to the Commonwealth and, that's my emphasis, the region in which the gaming establishment is located. Uh, in section uh, 18, um, which is the objective by which licensees would be measured and granting them, uh, section 18, uh, Section 11 talks about maximizing the revenues by the Commonwealth. Uh, and finally, you know this, so I'll just remind you of this, um, Section 19 that talks about the issuance of Category 1 licenses, um, it is a permissive statute. The Commission may issue not more than three Category 1 licenses. Um, it, is not, uh, it is not required. Um, I don't want to delve too deeply, but I would be remiss if not mentioning um, Section 91 of the Expanded Gaming Act um, that did uh, talk about the difference initially in Region C. 
in terms of a set aside for tribal gaming. And that could be a whole other discussion, but I did want to mention it. And while I'm not going to mention much about tribal gaming in my presentation, obviously um, Todd and Justin are going to give you an update on what's going on in that. Um, the other thing I will mention before um, uh, is that um, uh, in the packet with uh, Todd's materials is a letter from the lawyers for Mass Gaming and Entertainment in which they suggest their own RFI questions that I know you've had an opportunity um, to look at and I know they have representatives here today. So I did want to mention all those things is by way of introduction. So uh, maybe, um, as I said, the sort of two areas I uh, suggest talking about are both process and substance. Um, in RFI versus public comment, again, not mutually exclusive. And then the areas that I, that I have suggested some questioning on, which again, are not exclusive. There may be other areas you all are thinking about. Commissioner? Yeah. Um, Executive Director Bajorjan, you mentioned that you thought that the um, it's typically presupposed that the RFI then will help inform the RFP, correct? Uh, the RFI is generally used to help inform a future procurement process, yes. but does not mandate right. a future procurement process. I think when I thought about the RFI, it was, it was information um, valuable to help think about timing. Um, as well as um, the appropriateness of, of when and if that should be happen. I, I did not think about it as, well, you know, we're going to presuppose that we will, one will lead to the other. So I, I just kind of wanted to clarify I mean, I, that I difference. I think that that's a, uh, <coughs> that's a very, I think that's fair, and I think I did the same, uh, mm -hmm. Gail, mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Cameron. I, I think that uh, the footnote is, is um, is noted, but one of the questions that is laid out here or meant, is about the timing. <clears throat> My thought was an RFI could be a vehicle, and maybe it is also public comments, either one, to find out if we're going to spend money on doing a market study, we would want to do it at an optimal time as opposed to receiving a market study that starts with the premise, well, this is not the optimal time, but if we make certain assumptions, this is what you could, you could, um, you, you, you might find to be the case. Mm -hmm. So an RFI, if we were to issue it, and, and correct me, Executive Director Brajosian, if I'm wrong, could be what factors do we have to consider when we are thinking about the timing of getting a market study? Mm -hmm. and, if they, it, and that would inform, if we do do a, an RFP for a market study, when we would issue it. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. So it would. I looked at it. As yeah. Well. So I guess it's not necessarily forming. In that case, it's not informing what's in it, but when we actually issued it. I mean, my conundrum with the RFI versus public comment too is your different audiences, different mm -hmm. questions. And my concern with putting what are broader questions that we all have into an RFI is it goes into combines, and that is structured. It's not mandated to have anything that follows, a procurement process that follows, but that is somewhat what, it, what is anticipated. So while you may be getting some responses from people who would give you market study, there are a number of other questions that are in this proposal in front of us to think about and what we've all talked about. So not only are they not mutually exclusive, but I'm not so sure we should be grouping them together. I think there might be a more streamlined RFI question that really does speak to potential vendors and then a broader question of public comment in terms of the bigger questions and the statutory questions we have in front of us that I think we're going to want to answer before and maybe at the same time as So as you're suggesting that certain vendors. questions are more appropriate for public comment right. and then I, I think that and, and I'm might have been that it implying that. Clutter, that it might, you know, clutter an RFI too because the conversation that we just had about you might have people that are looking at their codes, looking at what you're doing, you may see all this other chatter on there and they may just turn a blind eye or deaf ear to it and think that's so much of that is beyond what I'm doing. I'm not so sure it's going to be very effective if we do it that way. I'm, 
I'd be curious to know your experience in the past with the RFIs in terms of what they've looked like and the types of things that you've looked for. So, so most RFIs are, are what Ed led to. It's a way of gaining information that most state agencies don't have like we have here. We have open public meetings. You can bring people in. You can get points of view. You can talk about the policy of it. And, you know, most state agencies have to put together a round table or a discussion group, and you don't get the big thoughts. So you would start off with those um, concepts that you're coming up with here, and then you would pare them down into an RFI to get the business community to then engage um, and, and get that thought process. So what you're talking about, um, I have seen wide-ranging RFIs that don't get much response or you don't get what you're looking for. Um, and then I've seen the roundtables followed up by a very specific RFI um, for information. And some of them have led to procurements, and other ones haven't led to procurements. Um, so there, it isn't a requirement, um, but it usually is in the whole procurement process, which is what you're talking about with Regency anyways. Do you do it or don't you? Do you do the actual application or don't you? Um, so I think it's an appropriate vehicle for what you're looking for. I think if you can streamline it down after you've had public discussion or public meetings over the broader broader discussion, it would probably be more, um, more effective. But it doesn't mean you have to do it that way. And that was my conversation with Ed. Um, we have a very unique platform here with the public meetings and with the um, awareness of our public comments that you can pare the RFI down quite a bit um, and do a public comment process first. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. So, and, and I really thought it was interesting, the idea of um, not doing both to give us the same information, maybe utilizing the two vehicles in a different way to gather different information. And from different audiences, Correct. as you said. Yes. Yeah, different stakeholders. Um, even the folks who come here are going to be different from yes. um, folks who might be responding to a combine. We mm -hmm. might get um, uh, folks who, ha who aren't following us, uh, which, which right. might be in <clears throat> interesting. Um, Commissioner Stebbins, do you have a, a question right now? No, I mean, I, I agree with the comment that's been made. Maybe there is an opportunity, and I've had some of this conversation with Executive Director Bedrosian about maybe tailoring, more narrowly defining some of the questions, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the first question right off the bat is, what obligation does the Commission have? I think we know that. Um, you know, is our executive director just pointed out the places in the statute where we have that authority, I think, to help answer that question for ourselves. I think where we get into the meat is on uh, the second page uh, uh, with a list of questions that continue as well as the questions under uh, uh, impact on region C. Um, again, you know, it's, it's, it's a way to kind of tailor the questions, I think, I think both your points put it out there. Not only solicit some public comment, we do that a lot, but also hopefully engage some folks that are really, uh, this is their market niche, this is what they do, and try to get them to step up and, and offer a response. Again, we want to make sure the RFI does not exclude anybody who responds from participating in an RFR or an RFP is the next, if we move to that next step. Um, I think I think some of the questions are right on. What is what is the impact? What's the market look like in Region C? What is the impact of what neighboring states might be doing? You know, what neighboring states have been doing in terms of the impact on the marketplace. Um, so I I offer those comments and you know just think. I know this isn't up for a vote. Do we? narrow down the specific list of questions and come back at a future meeting and do a vote to officially endorse the RFI. Um, but uh, you know, I, think, I think it is a helpful step for us to take. 
Council, I think we can get to the ultimate process at the end of our discussion. Maybe just right now address some of the substance, um, if you have any substantive questions um, about uh, that are put forth by uh, the Executive Director. And then also, of course, we appreciate, I'm sorry, I'm stepping back from my microphone. Uh, my point was that we want to make sure that um, substantively we're addressing any questions and then uh, also, I want to note um, my appreciation for Goodwin Proctor for submitting its um, public um, uh, comment and the others who have submitted public comments. Uh, we, we heard also from uh, Denton, which represents Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe, and uh, we also heard from the state of Rhode Island. So we thank always. Uh, folks for submitting public comments. It's a very instructive. As uh, Executive Director Drojan mentioned, the Goodwin submission does include uh, potential questions. I thought um, this is certainly something that we heard uh, during the, the motion for reconsideration, whether in fact there would be um, interested parties in um, Regency who would be uh, inclined to even engage in an application process. Mm -hmm. That might be a question that we do want to uh, put forth. It's straightforward. Uh, with that said, I don't know if we'd want to in any way that, that wouldn't tie um, anyone down in terms of if they didn't respond, uh, if there's no application uh, requirement in front. In front of us, uh, we wouldn't make a company commit at this point, but that might be an interesting question to present. Uh, substantively, I am, I do think one thing that is, uh, would be hard for us to assess, and I think expertise uh, from it through an RFI might be helpful, is how would we uh, structure any kind of a uh, request for a market study to properly assess the implications for the Commonwealth? Mm -hmm. Uh, versus the region. For some reason, the region seems more straightforward to me, uh, how we assess the Commonwealth. And I think uh, we do have an obligation to consider the best interests of the Commonwealth as well as the region. The questions do reflect the struggle that we have with respect to equity. Uh, and it's not lost on, I don't think, any of us here that a Regency uh, uh, folks, not all, may be interested in having a casino uh, because of the um, economic benefits that we've seen uh, are coming through both region A and B. Uh, yet we are not obligated, as you mentioned through our statute, to um, issue the um, a, a, another a, another license. So I am particularly interested in the question around the impact of a region C in the absence of our issuing mm -hmm. a, um, a license. So that's a little bit of a different twist. And I, I'm not sure if it would be in the same market study or if we could ask uh, under mm -hmm. the same RFP for both a market study of Regency and the come up, and then also the, the absence of, a, of an issuance of a license. Would that be a, is, would that could that be served? Could the, that question be answered by the same RFP? So, again, the the, right. the vehicle for answering questions is one. Are you thinking RFI? Well, not RFP, right? So okay. In the RFI, okay. would um, would a single market study be able to address yeah. so many diverse questions, yeah. or would it be better to parcel it out? Yeah. Well, I think informed um, opinion on that would be invaluable. I do remember from the last time we uh, participated in this process um, with market analysis uh, that we conducted for Region C, uh, they did, in fact, talk about uh, different parts of the region and how they would affect okay. other um, regions, meaning out of state as well as our own other licensees. So. We did have access to some of that information previously, and I, I do think it's really important that we look at it, the entire Commonwealth. Um, so I, I think it's possible, I guess is what I'm saying, because 
we did have some of that um, information available to us when we were reviewing Regency the first time. Did you have it gaming only or other economic impacts? Um, we really, they really, well, they gave us um, different regions of the, and th we did this for all of the regions. This wasn't unique to Region C. They talked about uh, the market analysis. If you put it in this side of the region, it have the ability to make um, this kind of money for the Commonwealth uh, as opposed to here. But here you may be able to make more money, but you will be cannibalizing from your other licensees. Yes. So it's, a, it's not so straightforward. There were lots of considerations that we talked about and factored into our decisions um, with, with the slots as well as the other licensees. So um, I know that was valuable information to us the first time, and so we're, we're able to, to gather that kind of information. And so including jobs and other yes. economic right. benefits. Yes. Well, I think an, uh, maybe a next step, and please chime in, would be perhaps to think about these questions and including any questions that um, are both um, directly raised in our public submissions or are less directly raised and see and, and think about which would be best addressed an, uh, RFI, through which vehicle, uh, yeah. an RFI, a public comment, or something else that we're not thinking about right now. What do you think, Commissioner Stebbins? Is that the I, I, I think that's a, a great approach. You know, regardless of the questions we put in the RFI, to put those out for any member of the interested mm -hmm. public to weigh in is valuable also. It might mm -hmm. also help us guide some direction as to our next steps. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a good uh, path because I could, you know, see some of these very easily lending themselves to public comment. Mm -hmm. uh, more, they're more policy-based, public comment-based, and some around the granularity of a market study, when that should happen, what are the best factors to consider, seem to be more lending themselves to a RFI so you'd have uh, you know the people put eyes on them and hopefully respond that you mm -hmm. want. Yeah. Um, right. And I do appreciate the fact that if you, there could be some mixing up of of interests if you know if you group them all together. But why don't um, why don't I go back with staff? Um, we've heard the conversation um, and come up with a, a list of RFI questions, a list of public comment questions. Um, with the idea that the RFI questions will be more specific on the on sort of the metrics and granularities of when to potentially do a study, how to measure impacts, um, uh, and I think the public comment questions might be more policy based. In you know, I, as I think um, is, issues about the expanded gaming act or maybe the authority of the commission or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And do we think um, information, a critical piece of Regency um, the first time it was open was the fact that because um, the, uh, the tribal casino, potential casino, um, was, was the backdrop um, that really restricted those some of those um, potential applicants from from finance from from obtaining um, finance. So I, I don't know if that would be a public uh, a public uh, comment question. You know how much is that change in the, in the number of years? Um, is there still the same thought that because that is still out there as a possibility that 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 hurts uh, competition. So I, I think that's that was really so. Important. You remember in your in the early reports that financial um, institutions were were just not prepared to to make the capital investments because they thought the tribe potential yes. for the tribe undercutting that business. Yes. So a, a fair question would be, given where we are now and what we're about to hear yeah. from Mr. Grossman, does that that status shift that analysis for any financial institution? 
That's a that's a very interesting well, point. And I, it may be that the, be you the could, market. that is one aspect of the potential tribal mm -hmm. uh, gaming. I think there right. are probably other implications of what is the, from a right. commercial side, how are they valuing that risk, if at all. Correct. And right. you've certainly got that. Finance would be one. I'm sure there's all there's a whole bunch of others that the experts in commercial casinos would maybe also comment on. Well, that would be informative. So I think a natural uh, next step, if we're extending to public comment, public comments are, <coughs> as I understand, what we um, have requested are usually done in writing. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, this is different from a public hearing, which I understand you've conducted in the past, where yeah. you would go to the various regions to hear from the people of the regions. At this juncture, are we asking for that, or are we going to ask for more technical, um, the, the more technical policy-driven um, uh, questions and comments now through both the public comment request and the RFI? The reason why I ask is because we have already received, of course, through public comment, uh, letters from uh, folks who live in Regency, and they've stated their position with respect to, um, I believe, all that I've seen are Brockton-based, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Are we inviting that now, or do, uh, and is that an important piece to ask for at this juncture? I would think this information gathering, public comment, and um, RFI would help inform us if, in fact, we then would need a hearing. And that, that's a better vehicle for getting that so, community input. I think so. I think right. I would suggest that let um, us go back, sort of delineate and make more granular the questions, separate about RFI, public comment. Having said that, Chair, I think you make a good point. There's members of the public who listen and are aware and want to send their thoughts in, and that's public comment we'll always accept. They may mm -hmm. just say, mm -hmm. this process is crazy that's or it's not crazy or whatever, whatever their feelings are, and they're entitled, and we take those at any time. So we would never right. say we're not accepting public comment. It just may be slightly different once we... It's a different know. form right now than what you've done in the past with respect to a public hearing, but of course they could always that's submit right. through the co public comment process yeah I, I would I would share that uh, it'd be in agreement with that you know looking ahead to in, <coughs> we've had numerous public hearings we've had them as part of a process for looking at applications if we find ourselves getting to a more meteor stage of a conversation either we have you know we're moving to an RFP phase where we have maybe selected somebody to come in and give us their analysis, I would think that might uh, be in a more opportune time to have a public hearing to share more of that meaty or detailed information with the public. Good. So I think I have some direction. Um, Sufficient and, direction? Yes. Any, any, and of course, this will allow you to um, also speak with uh, Commissioner Zuniga. Uh, he's not here today. I know that he would have input, um, you can update yeah. him and see if he has additional thoughts. I will. Excellent. Th I will. Th thank, thank you. you so for, that's the rest of my it, yeah. it, it helped um, very much for thinking. Thanks, Derek. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. So this is a simple exercise. <laughs> Thank you. We're now moving on to, uh, is it, I've lost my notes. Um, item, five. Uh, item five, we've completed item four, and now we have our interim general counsel, Todd Grossman, with attorney Justin Stepek, and we've asked them to provide a status of the tribal litigation and federal legislation uh, regarding the tribe, and as I said, it's not it, it is complicated. So thank you for this this effort. And thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good morning. 
Um, as the Commission has requested, uh, Mr. Stempek and I put together a presentation relative to the status of the litigation involving the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, as well as the federal litigation, uh, legislation related uh, to that subject matter. Before we dive in, though, there are a couple of points I just wanted to make about our presentation, if I may. Uh, the first is that we will not attempt to project or predict or handicap the outcome of any of these pieces of legislation. They are all being litigated by very able, capable, competent attorneys on both sides. Um, and it would be unfair of us to sit in this forum uh, without the benefit of them arguing directly to us and attempt to uh, assess who has the better arguments, who's going to win anything of that nature. There's been uh, ample public uh, pontification as to the outcomes of these matters, including the legislation. Um, but nobody can sit and predict the outcome with any measure of certainty. So if it's uh, okay, we don't intend to uh, get into that realm uh, here today. We will, of course, present you with the facts of the matter and um, the status and any, answer any other questions that we may be able to. The second is that we will offer you a broad overview of the law and jurisprudence uh, affecting these pieces of uh, litigation and uh, legislation to uh, enable you as commissioners to uh, guide your decision making relative to uh, Region C. However, there have been master classes taught on some of the areas that we'll discuss here today. We've attempted to distill these issues, though, down to their essence, to just provide you with the best information we can, again, to help inform your decision making. We are, of course, prepared to expand on any areas that are of interest uh, to any particular commissioner. With that, um, if I may, Madam Chair and Commissioners, I'll kick things off by jumping into the first uh, couple of slides, then I'll turn the presentation over to Justin, who will take it from there. And we'll start with uh, the first slide here. As you can see, the law actually mandates that the commission do precisely what it is that we're doing here today. And section 67 uh, says that the commission shall continue to evaluate the status of Indian tribes in the Commonwealth, including without limitation gaining federal recognition or taking land into trust for tribal economic development. The next slide is designed to offer a roadmap of the presentation and help put these matters into chronological perspective. While it's not an exhaustive list of all things uh, related to tribal gaming, we have selected those matters that we believe are necessary to inform decision making by the commission relative to Region C. We'll discuss most of these items uh, in the further slides that will come in detail um, them as best we can for you. And of course, we can reference back to this slide um, if that would be helpful as well. The only, uh, not the only, but one of the uh, issues that we realized that was not included on this particular slide that may be an interesting point of reference is just that the Commission's decision on the application in Region C for the uh, gaming establishment in Brockton was made on April 28th of 2016. So that would be the top of the uh, second column here. On slide number three, uh, before we move into the litigation involving the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, we thought it'd be helpful to touch on a bit of the law and jurisprudence, uh, jurisprudence that's at the core of the cases and adds uh, some context to the discussion that will follow. The first thing to just be aware of is the Indian Reorganization Act, or IRA, as it's commonly referred to. Um, the IRA, as you may be aware, was a piece of what has been referred to as the Indian New Deal. It was enacted um, in 1934 and efforts uh, at a time when efforts were being made to assimilate Indians into American society um, to the detriment of preserving their culture and their history. So the IRA was a recognition that this was not the proper policy direction for the United States. 
And the law set out to strengthen, encourage, and perpetuate Indian tribes and their historic traditions and culture. The Supreme Court uh, recognized this in a 1974 case where it said that the overriding purpose of the IRA was to establish machinery whereby Indian tribes would be able to assume a greater degree of self-governance, both politically and economically. And finally, on this point, uh, there's a passage in one of the cases that uh, Justin will discuss. This is the case out of the DC Circuit. Judge Collier there summed up the IRA um, uh, better than I could, so I thought we would just include her language right in here, where she said that the IRA was adopted in 1934 to change a century of oppression and paternalism in the relationship of the United States and its Native American tribes. And this is the part that's relevant to our discussion here today. Its purpose was to create the mechanisms whereby tribal governments could be uh, reorganized and tribal corporate structures could be developed as well as to make the acquisition of lands easier to be held in trust by the United States to enlarge or create new Indian reservations. The United States Secretary of the Interior is delegated the authority to acquire land in trust for Indian tribes. The Secretary's authority under the IRA is cabined by whether a tribe meets the statute's definition of Indian found in the, uh, the IRA. And we'll discuss uh, that definition momentarily. But it's before we get there, I just wanted to point out that it's notable what the IRA does not discuss, and that is gaming. The IRA was not a gaming act in any way. The gaming piece of the equation is addressed in 1988 by Congress when it enacted the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. That's the federal law that governs uh, Indian gaming, contains the familiar class one, two, and three categories of uh, Indian gaming. What it also though, uh, does though, is essentially requires that Indian gaming be done on what is referred to as Indian land. This is how uh, the, uh, the uh, Gaming uh, Act ties into the IRA. The IRA governs how land is taken into trust and becomes Indian land. And specifically, the IRA authorizes the Secretary of the Interior to acquire land and hold it in trust, quote, for the purpose of providing land for Indians. It is the definition of the term Indian that forms the basis of most of the uh, litigation that we will get into momentarily. So we can have a look at <coughs> that definition here on slide number four, where we talk about um, an important case uh, relative to this, which is Kacheri v. Salazar. So Kacheri v. Salazar um, is the widely cited and off-referenced 2009 U.S. Supreme Court case in which uh, an important part of the definition of Indian under the IRA was interpreted by the Supreme Court. And uh, as we say here on the slide, the case addressed the authority of the Secretary of the Interior to take land into trust on behalf of a tribe based on that uh, IRA definition of Indian. Prior to, Karcher to Kacheri, it appears from uh, a number of commentators and otherwise that the BIA's position was that the IRA applied to all federally recognized Indian tribes. So it wasn't until the court addressed this issue that the uh, jurisdictional issues became uh, really part of the landscape. So the IRA defines um, the term Indian as we have up here on the slide, and it has three components to it. It's really the first two that we will focus on here today. The third has never really been part of this uh, litigation. So Kacheri itself talked about the first definition of Indian, which is uh, all persons of Indian descent who are members of any recognized Indian tribe now under federal jurisdiction. And it's that underlined and highlighted language that the court focused on in Kachiri. It's the second part of the definition that became relevant to the uh, Massachusetts litigation that you'll hear about, and that part provides that an Indian includes all persons who are descendants of such members who were on June 1st, 1934, residing within the present boundaries of any Indian reservation. 
So those are the two um, important uh, parts of the definition of the term Indian from the IRA. The Supreme Court held specifically that the authority of the BIA to take Indian lands into trust hinged on the phrase now under federal jurisdiction. The court held that the term and uh, now under federal jurisdiction unambiguously, and this is a quote from the case, refers to those tribes that were under the federal jurisdiction of the United States when the IRA was enacted in 1934. So that was really the subject uh, of the case is what does the word now mean in now under federal jurisdiction? And the court concluded, and it was a majority decision, though there were uh, concurrences and there, were, uh, there was one dissent, uh, but it was a majority decision. The court uh, held that now meant in 1934 when the IRA was enacted. So that obviously had a big impact on uh, Indian law and how the BIA was able to take land into trust on behalf of Indian tribes. Kacheria is interesting for what it did not address and that has led to some of the further uh, litigation and the M uh, memo that we'll talk about really briefly uh, on this slide as well. The majority did not address the timing under which the tribe had to be recognized under the definition nor uh, did it determine how it should be determined what under federal jurisdiction actually means. And that's what um, the solicitor of uh, the uh, DOI uh, addressed in the uh, M memo that we describe a little bit below. But she picked up on a theme that Justice Breyer talked about in Kachiri and his concurrence. And he pointed out that um, an interpretation that reads now, the word now, as meaning in 1934, may prove to be somewhat less restrictive than it first appears. That is because the tribe may have been under federal jurisdiction in 1934, even though the federal government did not believe so at the time. So that has left the door open to um, the DOI, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and others uh, to assert that a tribe may be covered, in, even in light of uh, Kacheri, uh, under the IRA and land may be able to be taken into trust. So there's the, the distinction between formal recognition and being under jurisdiction that is uh, a critical component to the upcoming litigation. So with that, if there aren't any specific questions, we can move right into the Mashpee Wampanoag case. And uh, so I'm going to be addressing the three federal cases, uh, as Todd mentioned, um, just also with respect to his partial disclaimer at the beginning. Each one of these federal cases has dozens of filings uh, comprising hundreds, if not thousands, of pages. So. Uh, this is really a, a sample uh, understanding to really distill it down to the key factors that are relevant in each case. There's a lot to discuss and unpack with each one of these cases, so I'll try and touch on all of it, but if there's any further discussion on specific points, I'm happy to get into that, uh, possibly at a later date with a later presentation. But So if we look at the, the slide here, there's three cases. There's the Littlefield case that took place in the District of Massachusetts. There's the little, which was then appealed to the First Circuit in Littlefield v. Mashpee Wampanoag Indian Tribe. And then there's a separate and independent case out of the District Court in Washington, D.C., which is the Mashpee versus uh, the Secretary of the Interior, originally uh, Mr. Zinke, now uh, Mr. Bernhardt. Um, so just starting with the Massachusetts case first, this case, uh, as you all are aware, was a citizen group challenge to the land and trust status of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. Uh, as Todd mentioned, this was a challenge under that second definition in the, in the IRA. So really what was being analyzed was uh, the, the, the phrase, um, this, such members was the focus, is descendants of such members. How is that interpreted? So uh, what Judge Young in this case was looking at was when you're referring to such members, what does that mean? It, what is it? What it, what it, how do we interpret that under rules of statutory interpretation? And what Judge Young concluded was he said such members refers back to the first definition in the IRA of, this, this is also from that same definition, all persons of Indian descent who are members of any recognized tribe now under federal jurisdiction. So he says, he, what he said was since a tribe was not under federal ju jurisdiction in 1934, 
it could not qualify as Indian under the IRA, and thus the secretary could never have taken it, uh, the land into trust. And as a result of that decision, he remanded it back to the DOI for further proceedings along the lines of the other um, definitions of Indian in the IRA. Um, critically, the factual question of whether they, the tribe was actual, actually under, quote unquote, federal jurisdiction was not before Judge Young. And he was actually asked to clarify his, his original opinion with a motion for reconsideration and clarification. And he explained that. He said, he said oh, I, my decision was not, I was not analyzing that particular factual issue. That was not before me. Um, that can go back to the DOI for further interpretation by them as they are the administrative agency charged with interpretation of that statute. Um, so what, what then occurred was, so the DOI, the Department of the Interior accepts that clarification decision, and they go back and they come up with another record of decision interpreting uh, tribal status and land and trust. They requested evidence from the tribe. They received what I understand to be reams of evidence, hundreds if not thousands of pages of, of historical documentation and the like. Uh, and then in a secondary record of decision, which came out in September of 20, 2018, they determined that the tribe did not qualify as under federal jurisdiction in 1934. And so that's the, that was uh, pursuant to the, the, that first definition. And then they've referred back to Judge Young's d judicial decision and said, OK, so the tribe doesn't qualify for land and trust as Indian under either the first or the second defin definition as put forth in the IRA. Um, so that then takes us to the appeal of the decision. Um, so after uh, the decision by Judge Young, um, the originally the Department of the Interior actually appealed the decision to the First Circuit. But then with the change in the presidential administration, they voluntarily dismissed their appeal, which created some procedural issues in the federal district court, which I don't need to get into in too, too much depth. But basically, there were questions raised as to um, whether that the cause of action in the First Circuit still was valid in light of what was going on in D.C. because the D.C. action in, in uh, a nutshell is challenging the, uh, b the decision of the Department of the Interior, the secondary decision in uh, September of 2018. So the judge in the First Circuit asked uh, the parties in the First Circuit to show causes. Wh why is this not moot by what's going on in D.C.? If D.C. is challenging the actual record of decision, isn't that kind of moot what's going on here in the First Circuit? Um, and then there's a secondarily this procedural issue about the fact that since the Department of the Interior dropped out of the First Circuit case, is there really, um, and there's only a tribe, which is essentially a private actor charge, uh, challenging an administrative action which was remanded, there's some questions of whether there's proper jurisdiction and standing. Um, so uh, what's, what's happened most recently in the First Circuit case is uh, the tribe has filed its appellate brief challenging Judge Young's reasoning, the, mostly focused on the interpretation of the phrase, quote unquote, such members. So there's a lot of uh, statutory interpretation and rules of construction, um, dozens of pages on uh, how you were to read that and how it could be interpreted differently than what Judge Young's uh, conclusion was. Um, the, the, op the opposing brief has yet to be filed. That First Circuit case remains pending. Justin? Uh, yes. Um when, can you remind me, it's not, it wasn't Ken Salazar, his successor you know, um, under the, would have been under um, the last administration, um, the Obama administration, his name or her name, the Secretary of the Interior? The, the Secretary so, of the Interior that rendered the 2015 decision? Right. Um, I actually have the but, 2015 decision. Right here, so I can. Did tell. they file? Did that secretary in the in the appeal actually file briefs with their arguments before the administration changed? I know it was a close time period. No, no, there was no briefs. There was no briefs. Mm -hmm. on, it was voluntarily dismissed be, before appellate briefs were filed in the First Circuit by the new administration. Yes. So the old administration never filed <coughs> any briefs. <coughs> no, they did not file any substantive but they, brief. They filed a notice of appeal, but did not have the opportunity to file a brief. Right. And, and, the, uh, and the name of that interior? Oh, it was a woman. That's right. Okay. That's and right. and the, the author of the original, the, uh, the original, I think, record of decision. That may, that may have been Jewel as well. 
So she just had the chance to file the notice of appeal and did the, not file right. briefs. So I just am, I was curious to get the benefit of those arguments that would have been presented by that secretary, of, but we don't have the benefit of a written brief. Right, that, that thus why there's been this sort of procedural and substantive wrangling that's taking place right now as to whether the tribe as a, because the tribe it's wasn't standard. originally a party to the district court decision, they came in as an intervenor. Yep. And so then it was some procedural questions are being raised now about whether they're, they can properly maintain the appeal since the original appellant uh, has, has now voluntarily dismissed right, I understand final that. final judgment, so. Okay, but there just were no documents, no <coughs> briefs filed. Um, okay. okay, and then, okay. Thank you, that okay. just clarifies it. Sure. Uh, now we're on to 11. Okay. I think you were going on to the next. Yes, the we're on to the next bullet. case here, which is uh, the, the DC case. So as I mentioned, in the district court in Washington, DC, what this case is, is the tribe's challenge to the record of decision from 2018. So that was the second record of decision put out by the Department of Interior, the one that found that the tribe was not under federal jurisdiction in 1934, despite the record of evidence submitted by the tribe. Um, so the tribe's argument in, in very basic terms here is that the secretary failed to properly consider all the factual evidence that was submitted and uh, failed to properly evaluate that it was under federal jurisdiction in 1934. Um, the Department of the Interior has responded and asserted that it did properly consider all the evidence in reaching its conclusion they make the traditional arguments that most administrative agencies would make and that there's a deference to an administrative agency, that there's a narrow scope of review, that their decision was supported by the administrative record, and that they properly evaluated all the evidence. Um, now, the, 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 tri the, tr the tribal interests also, aside from the, the sort of factual challenge and calculating the weight of the evidence, they referenced the fact, that sort of swinging all the way back to the IRA, they say you're what's happened here is the per original purpose of the IRA is not being met by, uh, in terms of what the, the, the policy guides were there. And also that there's a Indian canon of construction which loosely uh, says that statute should be const construed liberally in favor of Indian uh, tribal interests. Um, so in that DC case, the Littlefield plaintiffs from Massachusetts moved to intervene that they're also now part of the DC case they moved to try to transfer the case back to Massachusetts, which was denied by the Washington, D.C. judge. Um, and, but they have also filed briefs arguing in support of the DOI decision in D.C. So right now, you have a number of uh, motions and cross motions for summary judgment and oppositions there too, filed by both the citizen group, by the Department of the Interior, and by the tribe. So those are all currently pending. No action has been taken on any of those uh, motions thus far. And each one of those is a fairly significant piece of litigation on its own. But that's, that's a very, again, a thumbnail sketch of what's happening in D.C. And any anticipated timeline on that? I, what I've seen, uh, what I've seen uh, sort of reference was a six to nine months possibly for a decision. Um, but the, these are fairly, some of those filings are fairly recent as well. So they were, you know, this, pat, this fall, uh, about a month ago. So we're, we're uh, the, the, the ink is still wet on those documents. Um, so I think six to nine months, I would, I would, I, I would think probably on the longer, okay, the longer end of that estimate, because there's a lot of issues that need to be unpacked here by the judge. Um, and now, if there's no other questions on the litigation, I'll turn it back to Todd for a moment just to discuss the federal legislation initiative, so. Um, thank you. Um, before we do that, I don't know, there's one other case that there was some interest in discussing, and that's the KG Urban uh, matter, which we can get yeah. into. Now. Is this the right time for that? that I think I, this is I, probably a good time to break into that. I'll just, if I may, Madam Chair, just quickly tee it up and point out that as uh, Commissioner Cameron and Stebbins will recall as having been named defendants in that case, uh, it was decided uh, by the First Circuit in, uh, on August 1st of 2000 and 12, essentially there was an argument by KG Urban uh, who filed this litigation literally the day the New Gaming Act uh, was enacted, asserting that really section 91 of the Gaming Act, which we'll get into in a little more detail in a bit, uh, discriminated on the basis of race and violated the 
uh, state and federal equal protection clauses of the respective uh, constitutions. Um, so th those cases were, it's important to recall, though that case was decided at a time before the commission had really done uh, much uh, of anything as far as making decisions or opening Regency or anything of that nature. So. Um, I don't know if there are specific questions we can try to get into those, but uh, there has been assertion that the some of the language uh, highlights equal protection concerns relative to not immediately opening Region C by the Commission. Um, we have uh, always been of the opinion that where the commission has already opened Regency and already rendered a decision that the equal protection argument has dissipated in that there's no present indication that the commission is not opening Regency because it's waiting uh, to see what happens with any of these cases or that section 91 precludes any action or anything like that. So it is my and our uh, opinion, at least the legal staff, that the uh, language in KG Urban does not in any way, at the moment anyway, uh, preclude or, uh, or preclude the commission from uh, taking a close look at Region C um, in that there's no real, no equal protection uh, concern at the moment. Can you just give me a short, what's the holding of KG Urban? KG, well, that uh, basically, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly. Um, the holding was that um, it, part of it, yeah, thanks. The part of it talked about the Gaming Policy Advisory Committee, which isn't really relevant to this particular uh, conversation because the tribe had a seat on the Gaming Policy Advisory Committee, so there was some question as to the legality of that. Um, the, the court held that the company's equal protection challenge was ripe for judicial review, so it sent it back to uh, the trial court to take a look at that, um, and that it also found that based on the uh, information it had before it at the time, that the factors weighed against any injunctive relief. So the court wasn't going to step in and order the commission um, to uh, not enforce the Gaming Act or to uh, open up Regency immediately or anything like that. So it was really, a lot of it centered on whether injunctive relief was appropriate and, and things of that nature. Anything? I, I think one of the, things Todd mentioned as well should be kept in context is the KG Urban First Circuit decision was decided in 2012. So if you look, if you went back to the timeline slide here, you'll see a whole host of things that have happened after 2012 that if we had a KG Urban today, I, I, I believe that I could speak for Todd as well here, we'd have a very different analysis because there's a whole, the factual landscape has changed. Regency, we had opened it, we considered one applicant already. Um, and uh, not to mention all the things, as I mentioned, with the litigation involving the tribe and the Carcieri decision, all of these things have happened post KG Urban. So the KG Urban decision, although raising the equal protection issue I, um, and, and highlighting it there, we do have to recognize the timeline of, of, of significant actions that have taken place in the intervening seven years and how those would lead to potentially a very different decision if it were the same question were to come before the First Circuit today. If there are no further questions on uh, KG Urban, and of course we can circle back on any of these issues and provide you with further information uh, as we move forward, we can move on to um, slide number 12. Um, and uh, just like with um, a lot of the litigation, their commentators have offered a variety of opinions as to the likelihood of the outcome of uh, this particular piece of legislation, both politically and legally and what have you, but the, the facts of the matter are that in January 2019, Representative Keating uh, introduced 
the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe Reservation Reaffirmation Act. It was a refile from the previous uh, session, though this time he had 35 co-sponsors who joined at a variety of times, and it includes the entire uh, Massachusetts delegation, um, I believe. The bill itself, uh, which was actually uh, approved and passed by the House, would reaffirm the tribe's trust land uh, and ratify and confirm the Secretary of the Interior's decision to take the land into trust. It would also preclude the filing of any further matters and dismiss any pending federal uh, litigation concerning anything involving that particular land. Um, so it was uh, passed in the House in May of uh, this year. It was sent over to the Senate um, there was no further activity that we could find that's been reported uh, in the Senate. Um, again, there was uh, an identical bill that was filed last session by Senator Markey in the Senate. That particular bill was sent into committee and no action was taken on that. So that's the status of the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe uh, Reservation Reaffirmation Act. There has always, not always, there has been ample so-called Kacheri fix um, legislation that's pended, uh, been pending at different times in Congress, which would essentially uh, allow the BIA to take land into trust on behalf of Indian tribes, regardless of the dates of their recognition. <coughs> so it would take out the whole 1934 piece of Kacheri. There's never been any tremendous uh, movement, uh, as far as I'm aware, on any of the so-called Kacheri fix. Uh, legislation, but that's always out there and always a possibility. So that's the um, the legislation. Um, and finally, on slide 13, we'd just like to briefly address the, the, the tribe's position, which came in via this letter from uh, Chairman Cromwell on November 30th, um, and perhaps of of most uh, interest is uh, his quote where he referenced, he says that unless and until the land is taken out of trust pursuant to a plain reading of the Massachusetts Gaming Act, MGC lacks authority to award a category one license in region C in the absence of a determination that the United States will not take land in trust for the tribe. Now, he doesn't cite exactly where he's getting that from, but he appears to be referencing either section 91 chapter, par paragraph E, uh, which it is the cited language here, or possibly he may be referring, referring to the section 2.6 of the compact between the state and the tribe. Um, there's, I don't. Okay, let me, if I, I'm sorry, let me make, because I, I dug these out uh, last night, and Justin didn't have, and I didn't have a chance to discuss this, but so we're kind of uh, working off the cuff here. <laughs> um, there were actually uh, letters filed by both the tribal uh, attorney and um, uh, the Rush Street Gaming's uh, attorneys uh, arguing this very point. In it first came up in 2013. It was then reinstituted in 2016, right before the commission was about to make its decision in Region C. It was a matter, as I was able to go back uh, last evening and look at some of the transcripts, that as Commissioners Cameron and Stebbins may recall, there and it was it was a part of the broader question as to whether the commission should open Region C. It was a very complicated and difficult question dating back to 2013. Ultimately, of course, the commission did, re did open Regency and did actually accept a bid uh, and did make a decision on it. But the tribe um, has been clear in its uh, position that, as Justin mentioned, both Section 91E of the Gaming Act and uh, some language in the Compact would preclude the commission from opening regency to um, any tr any non-tribal, uh, so-called commercial um, entity. And if it's helpful, we have the language from the compact where essentially in the background section, it's not in this PowerPoint, but in the background section to the compact, so in the, the, what we would call recitals mm -hmm. oftentimes, uh, the parties agreed that Section 91 of the Act provides that if a compact negotiated by the governor is approved by the general court by July 31st, 2012, and that's a whole other issue. Right. Uh, it, it was and then it was denied, uh, rejected by the, the 
DOI and what have you. Um, the MGC will not issue a request for a Category 1 license applications in Region C unless and until it determines that the tribe will not have land taken into trust for it by the United States Secretary of the Interior. Um, and then it, it has a little more language, but that's the applicable language. Um, the, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of the Commission because this is well documented. Um, in commission meetings, and obviously the commission opened up Regency, so it uh, was of the belief that that did not stand as an absolute barrier to doing so. Um, but the essential position was that Section 91 of the Gaming Act, it's not in Chapter 23K, it's just in the Gaming Act, does not, by its, on its face, and that's the language you have here in the PowerPoint, actually say that. Um, it, basically just mandates action in certain circumstances, but it doesn't preclude action otherwise in the discretion of the commission. And that's, that was the discussion that uh, revolved around section 91. It's important, I guess, for today's purposes, and we can certainly get into it a little further, but just to understand and recognize that this issue does exist, um, and that obviously there are new commi or commissioners who weren't part of the initial discussions who may have a different take on um, these provisions. Um, so in the event we move forward or even in advance of moving forward, um, it's important to recognize that this is uh, an issue that will come up. But you um, and your colleagues, the legal department, made a clear, um, had an opinion that they disagreed with the interpretation of the tribe. That oh. has not changed. That was my opinion then, and it remains my opinion today. It would have been the tribe and the governor's office, because well, it's in the compact, correct? You, well, if, just to drill down a little further on that point, I, I don't want to in any way suggest that I'm disagreeing with the governor's office, because that's not. Well, that's I'm just wondering, because I want to make sure that we, it, the, the language you just read from 2.6 is the gov is the compact which was between not only was with the tribe and the governor is the, the other signature in the commonwealth the governor the on com behalf of the commonwealth right it's important if if we want to kind of put the whole thing in context and this is a whole uh, we could spend and probably should spend way more time on this than just the couple minutes we may talk about it right now but it's also important to read the compact holistically and not just that one provision that's the recital that's, I, I would argue, mm -hmm. is just part of the so-called recitals. It's mm -hmm. in the background. And you also have to understand that further on down in the compact, it specifically addresses what will happen if a commercial casino is awarded to a licensee in Region C. And it talks about how the tribe will not um, have to pay any part of its revenues to the Commonwealth. And there are other similar provisions where the compact recognizes that it was a it is a possibility that the commission will award a license in region C. So there's more to it than just the fact that this language exists in the background section of the compact. Because I wasn't here and um, I just would like to walk through your uh, what I think was the commission's thinking. So <clears throat> the language that the um, tribe has quoted that uh, Chairman Cromwell has quoted in his letter says that the com that if at any time after August 1, 2012, the Commission determines that the tribe will not have land taken into trust, then the Commission has an affirmative obligation to consider bids. But if the Commission determined that the tribe would have land taken into uh, trust, we weren't barred from going ahead that's and considering bids, position. and that's, that's your position. That's right. And that's why you did, in fact, back in 2016, open up Regency for applications. Mm -hmm. Essentially, that's right. And that would make sense because in order for the tribe to have um, a casino, it has to have the land and trust decision. But certainly the tax structure assumes that there could be both the tribal casino and a commercial casino. Right. And the so com the compact itself, and Todd 
mention this briefly, but it actually has a more of a discussion about exclusivity and what the value of exclusivity is and sort of balancing the interests of exclusivity vis-a-vis -vis the commonwealth versus the tribe and then ultimately concluding on this revenue adjustment based mm -hmm. on the existence of a Regency casino or the non-existence of a Regency casino and how that would affect the tax rate on the tribal casino in Regency. I understand. It might be worthwhile to have an amendment that does spell this out a little bit more carefully given that it is the tribe's consistent position. For those of us who are newer, what do you think, Commissioner O'Brien? Would you like that? Just a, or are you fine? You've got it. For record. An amendment to? Uh, to uh, just your, an amendment in terms of to your, just another page to describe what you Oh, just, to the PowerPoint. In the yeah. PowerPoint. Adding in the compact. Yeah. Just oh, adding a sure. page for the future. Not to any bill. No. <laughs> um, that's really helpful. And just for the record, I think you just have a little typo on the bullet, just so that folks know our, the act, the Gaming Act is 2011. We just oh, celebrated yeah. the eighth anniversary. Oh, that's a typo. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. can't believe we missed that. <laughs> Commissioner Stebbins, did you have any question on that? You were here, so you may remember this. No, no, I, it was, uh, it was um, the presentation was helpful going over it the other day with Todd to kind of get an update on all the pending litigation, and three ongoing cases, two ongoing cases. And if, it, you know, if it's not complicated enough, I know you've all heard this, uh, there is currently land and trust. It is. And as we understand, mm -hmm. there's not a mechanism to take land out of trust. They, the Department of Interior hasn't done that. That doesn't mean it can't happen, but it just yeah. goes, there's just layers of complicated procedure here. Mm -hmm. and, and the PowerPoint does show that these decisions are quite fluid in DOI. So that if we did have a change in the administration, I know this is contemplated by folks who have appeared in front of us or who have made public comment. Uh, if there were a change in administration next year, there's a possibility that DOI could issue or have an opinion that reflects the prior uh, Secretary of Interior who initiated that appeal. <laughs> but can I ask this, at a certain point in time, there must be, there, there's some reliance that they have to be, able to be able to build on the land in trust, despite a change in administration's opinion. They wouldn't be. That would be nice. Some kind of degree of reliance, if, in other words, if it were to change, with a change of administration and someone began building another change from DOI to suggest that there's a change. Yeah, we haven't seen it, but there has been a lot of fluid decision making here. And or the Senate could change and decide that to, to take the matter up in the Senate, the, That's House, right. that the House bill that was passed. Another Senate might, exactly. So it wouldn't necessarily just be the change in the administration, right. but the change in the Senate as yes. well. Mm -hmm. But it would still have to, have to be signed, signed by the president. Yeah. Yeah, it'd have to be signed by the same administration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And more questions? This has been, you know, I, I did ask for this uh, when, we, when we looked at the motion for reconsideration. I personally really appreciate you simplifying it. I understand how complicated it remains. This was very helpful uh, as a next step. Commissioner, do you have any further questions? No, agreed. I find it helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to take a 10 minute break before we move on to um, our, our new number six with uh, Dr. Lightbound.
We're now reconvening meeting 283. We'll restart with the Racing Division. Dr. Lightbound, please. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, today I have the COO of Suffolk Downs, Chip Tuttle, with me to uh, discuss some of their items. The first item is the Suffolk Downs request for approval of their simulcast import locations. Uh, normally these um, items are taken care of when uh, track applies for their live racing dates. So for instance, when um, you approved Plain Ridge's uh, application a few months ago, their locations were included in that as part of it. So um, since there isn't a live application in front of us now, um, this is being done separately. And um, their locations are locations that they've done in the past. So um, my recommendation is to approve these locations. Do you want to go over the implications of the deadline? There's a pending deadline. Oh. Yes, um, there's a deadline of um, uh, January um, what are we about? 15. 15th. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> and that's for all the tracks for all their simulcasting and account wagering. Um, so uh, obviously we're um, hoping to have something uh, from the legislature, an extension or a new bill in place um, by then so that we don't uh, have a disruption in racing. But until that point, we do need to go ahead and have um, these sites confirmed so that um, the tracks can send out letters to their sites that they are approved to use them. So simulcasting would be disrupted if that there is not an extension. Right, correct. Um, Alex, is it appropriate under the, we have, we're taking two votes. One is on ADW and the other one is on the simulcast import locations. But um, the introduction of FanDuel racing, is that under the ADW piece? Or yes, that's under the ADW. It's the ADW piece? Yes. Okay. This is just, just item A, the simulcasting sure. part of the, there's different simulcasting sites. Yeah. But the two items are addressed in the one letter. Yes, the, yeah, okay. Mr. Tuttle addressed them both in the same letter. Um, Madam Chair, I move the Commission approves the Suffolk Downs request for approval of the simulcast import locations listed in their November 8, 2019 letter. Okay, second. Second. All those in favor, with, unless there's any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 4-0. So the uh, next item is the Suffolk Downs request for approval of their account wagering providers. Um, several of these uh, have been long-term ones. Um, the uh, Express Bets, um, TBG, Twin Spires are all from the uh, early 2000s. Um, Naira Bets, the Gaming Commission approved in 2016 as a new provider. Um, and uh, Suffolk is also asking for this uh, this year for FanDuel Racing, which is going to be based on the um, TBG backbone. Um, I get the companies are the same now, but together. And um, basically the face of it will be um, FanDuel, so it'll attract uh, customers, hopefully from the FanDuel uh, site uh, to racing. And Chip Tuttle's here if you have any more questions on that. I know we have a, uh, a presentation on the FanDuel um, platform. So we're voting on it and then we'll look at the presentation? Well, that's part of your packet. If you want to look at the um, slides, um, we can cl flip through the slides that shows um, this is what enough. they are and, yeah. and what they're. Might as well would you like to have yeah, that? I would love to yeah. talk about it before we vote on it. I think mm -hmm. that makes sense. Okay. Sure how this, how I put it. <laughs> yeah, I think we have additional questions on the FanDuel and just the, the process too. So if you could sure. go through that. Mr. Tuttle, that would be great. <laughs> okay, this is the first slide. Um, this this slide was sent to us. Uh, this presentation was sent to us by the FanDuel Group as as way of background. Um, uh, Patty Power Betfair, uh, the British bookmaking company, uh, acquired TVG uh, several years ago. And then uh, Patty Power Betfair merged uh, with FanDuel, the daily fantasy sports company. Uh, I think that was about two, two, two and a half years ago. And um, you know they launched, uh, uh, as the commission is aware, the, the daily fantasy sports companies have gone into sports betting. Um, 
this company also had a background in paramutual wagering and, and horse racing by way of TBG. They're now the leading provider uh, of sports betting services in New Jersey. They're in Pennsylvania. They're in West Virginia. They're expanding into to various states under the FanDuel brand. Um, one of the, the things that they're trying to do is uh, take advantage of exposing horse racing to the daily fantasy sports audience that FanDuel has built up through the years. They have six, seven million account holders. Um, and so FanDuel Racing is really an effort to expose horse racing to these daily fantasy sports co uh, customers on the FanDuel platform, on the existing FanDuel platform. So it's not being marketed to existing racing fans. Um, it's basically just on the FanDuel platform. Now there's going to be a, a, uh, an additional platform and, and integrated content where you're going to be able to click uh, if you're a daily fantasy sports player and, and uh, open an account to, uh, to play uh, horse racing as well through advanced deposit, the, the TVG advanced deposit wagering platform. It's sort of the TVG back end system, uh, the Oregon hub, uh, the multi-jurisdictional Oregon hub uh, is the licensing authority for this and um, it has been approved in uh, California, Kentucky, New York. Um, they plan to launch in 20 to 25 states uh, shortly after the first of the year, at around the first of the year. Um, and they've asked us if we would uh, come to you and include FanDuel Racing as one of our, uh, the Massachusetts authorized advanced deposit wagering entities. Yeah, so it really is the same company, just a new platform and an ability to reach a different audience. That's the intent, yes. And, and, um, but they, they put it under the FanDuel brand because... It's popular. Yeah, and, and those customers, I think the idea was those customers want to stay under the FanDuel brand as opposed to introduce a new brand to them that they may not have heard of or understand. So, Commissioner Cameron, I learned a little bit about the background on um, the approval of ADWs from Dr. Lightbound, but there, the commission did not require additional licensing requirements like we do. For instance, should sports betting be approved, you know, the operator of a sports book would, would likely be subject to our licensing processes that are currently in place for our gaming establishments or some sort of level of licensing, but we don't do that for horse racing, Well, we, we've talked about doing a more robust licensing uh, process, but because um, license, uh, rather racing was in such flux and the legislature needed to play a role, we made a decision to kind of hold off on that, expanding our licensing um, requirements when it comes to ADWs until we had some certainty. Um, I think we all thought the certainty would happen before now. Mm -hmm. So that, um, that is something we certainly could revisit. Because I do believe we need to do a little more work here, just to do a little more due diligence when it comes to uh, ADWs. So the ADWs in the past that, that have been approved? are all the ones as, that are listed in this letter? As part of the license, they've been approved in the past. Yeah, I, I may be able to add some color to that, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, in 2001, um, in the, the, the annual update or the, the semi-annual sometimes update of racing and simulcast statutes, uh, <laughs> um, uh, they, there was a change to specifically authorize ADW in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, the only licensing requirements were that uh, any ADW provider, you know, it, it had to be through an existing Mar Massachusetts paramutual licensee, could have been any of the four at the time, um, and that it was approved by your predecessor agency, the Racing Commission. And so that, that's just been the process since 2001. But we've made a lot of changes to the racing application, to the requirements, to the work that the state police in racing do. So we have um, uh, improved the process, I would say. Uh, there is more due diligence, but this is an area that we've identified as something that we could um, 
we could do uh, some more work along the lines of looking at these companies. Um, but as I said, we, we really made a decision to, to hold off um, uh, doing that until we had some certainty, and maybe we will have that certainty um, with the legislature working on or considering a number of bills. I, I think found you the, from the um, talking to the legal department that uh, we're going to go ahead and, and start looking at it over the dark season that we have for um, the winter gives us a good time to catch up with some different projects that we don't have time for during the season and um, you know start looking at these regulations we've already pulled a bunch of them from different states and um, kind of start to see where we might want to go and then obviously um, see where the legislature goes um, with the um, different bills that are out there and um, take that into account. So you, you said that California approved FanDuel racing maybe yes. last month. Yes. Did they do it based on the same information that we would be approving? They, or did they have additional information? Do they you have know? a detailed um, application procedure. Their application for um, account wagering is almost similar to our application for a racing license. So it was, um, you know, a very detailed application. So it was and a rigorous so they've review. Gone, right. They've gone through it in California. As well as the states that use FanDuel for um, sports Sport betting, betting. i.e. New Jersey, um, they have gone through a rigorous licensing process there in order to, um, uh, in order to operate in New Jersey. So the company and it's has the same been corporate vetted. entity. Can I just ask you a quick question? Sure. Um, I'm somewhat encouraged by what FanDuel is trying to do or position for the players in terms of introducing new folks to horse racing and, and, and race betting. Um, I guess who approached you as a TVG saying, hey, now, you know, if you're going to reapprove us or use us again next year? Let us tell you about the FanDuel piece or FanDuel. I mean, how did the um, yeah? I mean, start? it was it was TVG basically saying, "Hey, we're you know we're launching launching FanDuel Racing, and there are certain states that require specific uh, regulatory authority approval. There are others that don't, where they're active already and they can just do it under the the existing umbrella." Um, they identified Massachusetts clearly as one of the states, along with New York, Kentucky, California, Illinois, I believe, that required specific approval and came to us and said, as part of your license and uh, licensing and, and application process for uh, 2020, could you please include FanDuel Racing as an ADW provider? And, and based on our 18-year uh, relationship with TVG, and you know, we we. TBG has always been sort of the gold standard of advanced deposit wagering companies. Um, specifically, uh, you know, it doesn't do business in Texas. Other, other companies sometimes do because, you know, TBG has had a corporate policy uh, to only uh, do business in states where it's specifically authorized. They stay out of the sort of quote unquote gray states. Um, and uh, so they made the request and we followed up with this action. Um, I noticed a couple of the FanDuel slides. Again, I look at this as they're trying to introduce racing to their existing customer base. Um, have you had a chance to go through it and just kind of see from a, a tutorial uh, viewpoint? Does it offer somebody who's new to race betting um, enough information and enough kind of like background as to how to do it and what to look for. Yeah, they, they, um, they showed me the platform a few weeks ago out in, in California at the corporate headquarters in Los Angeles, but uh, I haven't, you know, gone on on my own mobile device or laptop to, uh, to experiment myself yet. Um, I suppose I could do that because I have opened a FanDuel account. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, for, for daily fantasy, but uh, I haven't yet. Okay. And I, I don't think it's, you know, I think it's in beta. I don't think it's, you know, it's active uh, yet, but I could, I could find that out. Yeah. Just curious to yeah. see how they plan to measure whether this is going to be a success for them or not. Okay. okay. Additional questions for Mr. Tuttle and Dr. Lightbaum? Uh, 
Madam Chair, I'd move the Commission approve Suffolk Downs request for Express Bet LLC, TVG, Twin Spires, Naira Bets, and FanDuel Racing as account deposit wagering providers. Second. Any further discussion or questions? I'm encouraged that um, by Dr. Lightbound's report that we'll be exploring uh, next steps on on how to review the ADW uh, count. So thank you. Um, those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 4-0. Thank you. Uh, the next couple of items are uh, Chad Bork, our Chief Financial Officer, will um, go through those for you. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So throughout the racing season, funds are deposited into a capital improvement trust fund and also a promotional trust fund uh, for both standard and thoroughbreds. Uh, funds are then distributed upon the commission's approval of both a request for consideration and also reimbursement. So the first item in front of you is a request for consideration and reimbursement of payment from the promotional trust fund submitted by Suffolk Downs in the amount of $192,971.10. Uh, I have reviewed all the supporting documentation to ensure funds requested were used for advertising purposes. And I also reconciled the vendor invoices against payments to ensure the uh, correct, correct amount is being requested, uh, which I found that it was. This item does require a vote. So, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve Suffolk Down's request for consideration and reimbursement in the amount of $192,971.10 to the Suffolk Promotional Trust Fund. Second. Second. Questions? Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I just want to point out to Chad that I didn't go on my rant about the promotional <laughs> trust fund. Yes, I did not. I, I did hear about that <laughs> position, uh, Commissioner Stebbins. Uh. There's plenty in the archive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well said, Chad. Uh, the next item we have is a request for consideration for the Capital Improvement Trust Fund. And this is submitted by Plain Ridge Park Casino in the amount of $40,338. Uh, I have reviewed all the supporting documents and found them to be in good order. Uh, also included is an opinion letter from Dixon Salo, who is the architect uh, that's charged with ensuring that um, the items is being requested or funds that are being requested um, are necessary in his opinion uh, these are necessary and he's recommending that uh, the consideration be approved and this is just for the consideration at this right. time not the um, reimbursement right correct that's correct mm -hmm. right. right. So we'll approve the consideration at this time? Yes. So, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve Plain Ridge Park Casino's request for consideration in the amount of $40,338 for the Capital Improvement Fund to purchase a replacement tractor at Plain Ridge Racecourse. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 4 0. Again, I didn't rant about the Capital Improvement Fund. Um, <laughs> before we let Mr. Tuttle go, uh, we're taking up a, an agenda item a little bit later, a letter of consideration to the legislature about the extension of the racing and simulcasting statutes. I know you've been part of those conversations. Um, any thoughts or viewpoints on the, the looming deadline and yeah. any suggestions for the commission? Um. Well, we, I mean, we've been part of the discussions, and, and I, I certainly don't uh, presume to speak for the legislature at, at any time. Uh, indications uh, we've received are that um, 
you know, as part of the discussion of sports betting and sports wagering bills in the spring that, you know, the legislature may uh, include longer term uh, examination of racing and simulcasting issues as part of that. And if that's the case, I think it means we're looking at another short term extension, um, you know, probably through July 31st or, or through the end of the calendar year of 2020. Uh, between now and January 15th, and, and given past precedent, I, my guess is, you know, sometime around January 10th or 11th or so, you know, there'll be another you know, a move to extend the racing and simulcast statutes as they are. You know, there, there's, I don't think there's going to be uh, opportunity for a lot of um, discussion about significant changes between now and January 15th. Thank you. Any further questions for Dr. Lightbound? Chad? Thank you. And Mr. Tuttle? Just one for Mr. Tuttle. Um, FanDuel originally a Scottish company? Um, they uh, formed uh, in, in Edinburgh, yes, uh, uh, Chairman. I mean, uh, Commissioner Cameron, yes, uh, where I, I know you've recently visited, as have I. So yes. it's a wonderful city. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to item number seven. Um, <clears throat> Investigations and Enforcement Division, Director Wells, and Chief Enforcement Counsel Loretta Lilios. You have two items today for us. Ms. Lilios is going to handle that with Mr. Curtis, please join us. I'm well. How are you? Excellent. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. First, I have the suitability of two MGM qualifiers for your consideration, uh, and they are Mr. Patrick Majamba and Mr. Paul Salem. Each of them submitted all of the required forms and complied with all of the IEB's requests for supplemental and updated information. The IEB also interviewed each of them in person. They were cooperative and forthcoming in all regards and in keeping with our established protocols for background reviews of casino qualifiers, we verified identity, confirmed financial stability and integrity, reviewed litigation history, searched criminal history, verified that no prohibited political contributions were made in Massachusetts, and conducted checks of open source and law enforcement databases. Turning first to Mr. Madamba, he is Vice President and Legal Counsel of MGM Resorts International, which is the ultimate parent company of MGM Springfield, our licensee. He took that position in August of 2017. And in that role, he has legal oversight responsibility for all of MGM's properties inside the U.S., apart from Las Vegas, which numbers, I believe, seven properties, including our licensee. He also is responsible for MGM's regulatory matters in the U.S. as they Im impact all of MGM properties. Mr. Seth Stratton, VP and legal counsel for the Springfield property, reports directly to Mr. Madamba. And Mr. Madamba, in turn, rep reports to uh, Mr. Hagopian, who is chief corporate counsel and also a qualifier for this license. Before joining MGM in-house in 2017, Mr. Madamba was a partner at the law firm of Fox Rothschild in Atlantic City. And he was there for approximately 10 years where Almost all of his work was performed for MGM, and he did that until MGM brought him in-house, um, as I mentioned. He actually started working in the industry uh, at casino properties and security before completing his undergrad and law degrees. And during law school, he worked in the legal department at Claridge Casino in Atlantic City, where he got his introduction to gaming law. He previously worked as inside counsel for Players International in Atlantic City and as an attorney at multiple law firms representing uh, clients in the gaming industry. And he also worked for a number of years at a firm that specialized in patent law. 
He has a bachelor's degree from Stockton College in New Jersey in political science and recently obtained another bachelor's degree in biology, also from Stockton, and his law degree is from Rutgers. He's currently licensed or has been found suitable in multiple jurisdictions and a check with Maryland, New York, and New Jersey regulators indicate that his credentials are in good standing with no derogatory information found. I should mention that the IEB has had extensive first-hand dealings with Mr. Madamba, uh, Director Wells, myself, uh, the GEU, uh, from the time that MGM was a applicant for the Region B license. He has a wealth of information and experience. He's a veteran uh, gaming law uh, attorney, and he takes a highly proactive approach with his communications and disclosures to the IEB about activity at the MGM corporate level. Uh, he's always responsive uh, to <coughs> inquiries by the IEB and is forthcoming in all of his dealings with the IEB. He has demonstrated uh, to the IEB by clear and convincing evidence that he is suitable under our uh, criteria and our regulations and statute, and the IEB recommends that the Commission vote to find him suitable as a qualifier uh, for the Springfield license. Mm -hmm. Any questions for... Um, my other question is the timing between the submission of the application and the interview. Do you find any clarity as to the gap? Um, I think the, uh, there can sometimes be some time uh, before the uh, application is actually transmitted uh, to the IEB while the licensing division goes through and ensures that uh, you know, all the materials uh, have been submitted in the format uh, required. And you know, like all of our investigations, we are uh, prioritizing, you know, juggling multiple um, investigations and you know we given what we were dealing with uh, in the past year and our uh, familiarity uh, with Mr. Madamba we combined you know him and Mr. Salem uh, who was a new and you'll hear about in a moment um, you know all part of our risk-based approach. Thank you. I am um Agree with uh, IEB's conclusion here and reading this um, investigation report, very clean <coughs> uh, report, um, no issues of, of note at all. Um, so I would, uh, I would move that the Commission find Patrick Madamba suitable as a qualifier for Blue Tarp Redevelopment LLC. Second. Any further questions? Comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 4-0. Turning to Mr. Paul Salem, he was appointed to the Board of Directors of MGM Resorts International in August of 2018. He's an independent, non-executive member of the Board, and we perform the same sort of comprehensive review of independent directors of our casino licensees as we do on the inside directors. Mr. Salem sits on the Real Estate Committee, the Community Service Committee, and most notably the Audit Committee of the Board. He graduated from Brown University with a Bachelor's in Economics and later received an MBA from Harvard Business School. After receiving his MBA, he worked briefly for Morgan Stanley and left there within a year. He went on to start a private equity firm, Providence Equity Partners, with two fellow alumni from Brown. That firm is based in Providence, Rhode Island, and under Mr. Salem's tenure there as a senior managing director, the firm grew to manage $60 billion in assets. He stepped down from Providence Equity Partners in June of 2019. Of interest to sports fans here, he is a part owner of the Pawtucket and now the Worcester Red Sox. He currently is undergoing a background review by gaming regulators in Pennsylvania and Michigan. Maryland recently completed its review and reported to the IEB that he's in good standing with no derogatory information revealed. I do want to note before the recommendation that it was Trooper Morris and financial investigators David McKay and Matthew Jordan who performed the reviews of uh, these two qualifiers. Um, and as for Mr. Salem, he likewise has demonstrated by clear and convincing evidence to the IEB his suitability. Our recommendation is that you approve his suitability as well. Any, any questions? I, I would just 
point out, uh, Director Lilios uh, did some quick follow-up yesterday on a couple of questions I had about our qualifiers. So thank you for turning around that information so fast. The reports were very thorough. Thank you. Well, that's thanks to the investigators. They did a great job. Mm -hmm. Concur. Another clean investigation. And I would um, further move that the Commission find Paul Salem suitable as a qualifier for Blue Tarp Redevelopment LLC. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 4 0. Thank you. Thank Thanks to the you. team for good work. Thank you. We have another matter uh, on the agenda uh, today. Uh, regarding uh, an application form for independent directors of gaming vendor primary uh, applicants and li uh, uh, licensees. So the IEB and the licensing division have proposed an application form that's in your packet, the proposed forms in your packet, as well as a memo on this subject. And we're proposing that this form be utilized by independent directors of gaming vendor primary companies. These are the companies that manufacture and sell gaming related products to our licensed casinos. So they are slot machine manufacturers, card and dice manufacturers, et cetera. These independent or outside board members are not management employees of the companies, but they may be board chairs or sit on board committees like the Compliance Committee or the Audit Committee. These individuals we have found are often involved in many companies, may sit on many boards, and may have a lengthy history of employment in gaming-related companies uh, before their appointment uh, to the board, uh, to the relevant board of our applicant. Under our regulations, the independent board members of these gaming companies are not automatic qualifiers, and we have not been performing background reviews of them. We would, however, like to identify those independent directors that have substantial responsibility for the company's business in Massachusetts and perform a, an appropriate balanced background review of them and to that end the positions we would be most interested in are board chairs and compliance committee members possibly audit committee members we have found that the committee memberships on these boards uh, I'm sorry the committee memberships often rotate on a one or two year cycle so the background review utilizing the same form that we do for the inside directors does not lend itself to such a constant turnover. The, the attached form and uh, proposed protocol would allow us to streamline our focus. So we could concentrate on whether there are any concerns with an independent director's criminal history, licensing and regulatory history, and any information in the public realm that calls suitability into question. So if, for example, an independent director was previously running or a top executive at a company that has a history of malfeasance, we would want to know that. By contrast, a risk-based approach to this group of individuals suggests that we not perform a net worth analysis, uh, which is time consuming and intrusive and we feel does not appropriately reflect their involvement or contributions as an independent member. It's important to be mindful that we can always require supplemental, additional material if the information takes us, the investigation takes us down that route and the qualifier would be required to cooperate in that part of the investigation. Attorney Hardigan did perform some research into what other jurisdictions do uh, here. And the finding, uh, not surprisingly, is that the regulations are not always an apples to apples comparison, but uh, in the jurisdictions uh, we looked at, uh, or she looked at and reported on, uh, significant discretion is given uh, to the investigate, investigative team on whether to investigate independent directors with a focus, like our regulation, on 
whether the individual is making a substantial impact uh, to the company, the direction of the company, and its focus and strategy in the governing jurisdiction. It's our suggestion that we implement uh, a protocol like this, revisit it uh, in a number of months after we've had a chance to work with it uh, for a while. We do suggest going back and revisiting our current applicants and licensees and identifying those ind independent directors who we feel are making that kind of contribution or impact on the company um, and revisit it in, in six months uh, and report back to you. And we think this strikes a, a balance that gives us a meaningful review of integrity and suitability but takes into account uh, that these are not the inside executive team uh, at the company. So I'm sure you may have questions. Happy, uh, Mr. Curtis is here as well. Happy to try to uh, answer any questions that you have. So because of their role on compliance um, committees and or audit committees, you see um, some control, which warrants some further investigation. And as particularly with compliance, where matters impacting or occurring and involving the Massachusetts licensee may make their way up through the compliance committee, could be important to evaluate how the compliance committee is dealing with those matters. We do uh, try to review minutes of compliance uh, meetings now, uh, but membership on those committees, especially chairs of those subcommittees of the board, feel have an impact on the potential impact on the Massachusetts licensee. I know that the research demonstrates that everyone's red, uh, uh, regs are different, the laws are different, so different jurisdictions treat the matters differently, right? But there are some that, uh, that use a, a form like this or? I, I think the, um, the common theme through the jurisdictions um, that we looked at was that discretion is given. So typically, from what we can tell, not all of the independent directors are routinely investigated, uh, but the team, like in the scoping meetings that IB conducts jointly with the, with uh, Bill and his team, uh, where we get the company's leadership on the phone and we really try to understand uh, who's doing what uh, at the company. You know, we have our organizational chart that they provided us. We have our list of committee membership that they provided us. And we, you know, ask how things actually work. And through that uh, discussion process, uh, we try to identify uh, who is having an impact on the strategic direction of the company, and in particular, who has the potential to uh, impact uh, what's happening with the licensee here in Massachusetts. And that's a common theme uh, in other jurisdictions as well. They, it appears uh, that a case-by-case -case review is conducted in other jurisdictions as well. But at this time, you are not doing any reviews of these independent directors. That's correct. Under your current guidelines. So the touch is, uh, with respect to our jurisdiction, and that would include chairs, or would you propose that you're likely to always look at independent directors who are also chairs? That is our suggestion that, you know, the typical role of a chair is uh, to implement and set the strategic direction of the company. Uh, and, uh, you know, I should note that it, it's my um, impression that none of these companies will um, uh, object to this process because in other jurisdictions, you know, they may already be doing it and they, you know, are independent directors at gaming, highly regulated gaming uh, manufacturers. So it's a process that they would not be surprised at is my uh, assessment. Do, do we have a, and maybe Bill can answer this question, do we have a, what, I'm trying to get a sense of the landscape, how many people we're talking about. How many uh, gaming vendor primary companies do we have? Currently we have 24. Okay. 
So I, you know, I, uh, I like uh, Deputy Director Lilios' suggestion. I'd love to come back and look at this within six months, just see how it's rolling out. Um, you make the point that these chair uh, seats turn over periodically. And That's right. It's not really enough time to maybe do an in-depth look at somebody, but I'd be curious if that person was a chair all of a sudden is no longer in the chair, they're still serving on that committee to kind of track where their progression goes or do they move between committees. Um, again, well, assuming Sunday. you're, you know, we get the green light, um, we can calendar coming back in, in six months and uh, reporting. Any further questions for Deputy Director Williams? I think it's an excellent proposal. I do. I think it's practical, but also conservative enough that we're preserving um, the integrity of the gaming to the <clears throat> as required by statute. So, thank you. Questions? Do I have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I move the Commission approve the independent director qualifier application as included in the Commissioner's packet. This form shall be completed and submitted by independent directors designated as qualifiers for gaming vendor primary applicants and licensees pursuant to 205 CMR 134.04 4B2D. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 4 0. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Curtis, too. I mean, additional work. Uh, we are now going to break for lunch. I do want to uh, just explain that we will not be turning to Commissioner Zuniga's report on the Gaming Commission's annual report this afternoon. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, the Ombudsman's report and a report from, I guess it will be just them. It, uh, well, and also Director Griffin will have an item as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll break for, uh, it's 10 of 1 to 1.30. Good. Sure. Thank you so much. We are reconvening Massachusetts Gaming Commission meeting number 283 at 1.35. We'll begin with uh, number eight, Ombudsman Ziemba, please. Good afternoon, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, we're here today to propose final guidelines for the 2020 Community Mitigation Fund for your consideration. Uh, the next funding round begins February 1st, 2020. Joining me today are Construction Project Oversight Manager Joe Delaney, Director of Workforce Development Jill Griffin, and Mary Thurlow, our Community Mitigation Fund Program Manager. Uh, I want to thank them, Shara Bedard, uh, and Commissioner Stebbins for all of their work and participation in the process uh, to develop these guidelines. Uh, Chair and Commissioners, in your package you'll find the final draft uh, Community Mitigation Guidelines, a red line of the guidelines versus the prior draft. Um, I've also included a memorandum which highlights uh, changes that were made based on the meetings with the local community, community mitigation advisory committees, uh, the subcommittee on community mitigation, and the gaming policy advisory committee. Uh, additionally, the commission received three comments as a result of the public comment uh, request that we posted on October 25th. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to turn over to Joe uh, for a brief outline of some of the comments that we heard in our series of meetings. Uh, we very much thank the members of the LCMACs, the subcommittee, the GPAC, and other groups that have provided uh, very valuable input. Uh, Jill will also provide a brief overview of our outreach on workforce development and some of the issues that were discussed. However, first I'd like to just give a brief summary of the guidelines and some of the changes that we proposed. 
First, uh, let me address the overall recommended level of funding. Um, after our last meeting, we continued to review the recommended award target of $11.5 million that was included in the draft. Since the time of the last meeting, we've seen another a month's worth of revenue from our two Category 1 facilities. We also net, did another deep dive into the totals of our past awards, factoring in how much of the reserves have been utilized for each of those grants. Uh, detailed charts regarding these revenues and awards are included in your packet. But the bottom line is that we feel confident, ab absent something extraordinary for the last two months of revenues, that an $11.5 million program is reasonable for next year. Although it's significantly bigger than the prior year, the revenues will, uh, in all likelihood, be available to support it. We also believe that continuing a regional allocation of target awards is warranted, as was our practice in the last year's guidelines. Uh, and as you recall, we, we are recommending a $6.6 million Region A target and a $5 million Region B target. And we typically have had a $500,000 limit waivable uh, for Category 2 uh, impacts. Uh, Joe will describe a little bit of the input that we received on, on this matter. Um, we also continue to believe that grants for transportation construction are warranted. Uh, we received some comments that more spending could be made available for transportation construction. In the revised guidelines, we put in new language emphasizing the Commission's ability to increase funding for some categories based on its review. Specifically, we stated that the Commission could increase funds for transportation construction if other awards, uh, if other awards made for other categories do not reach the regional spending targets. Now, uh, annually, we always include a provision giving the Commission the ability to move up or, up or down in different categories and up or down on awards and up or down on the total amount of awards based on its discretion, but we thought just additional language would be warranted here to give in a, uh, the Commission's inclination that we could take a look at transportation construction, especially if we are falling below those, those regional targets. Uh, in regard to workforce development grants, based on conversations uh, at these Commission meetings, uh, we are recommending a target spending amount of 800000 The number is closer to the actual spending from this current year Although last year's guidelines had a $600,000 target, which is what we had in our prior draft, we, we actually authorized awards of $813,400. Uh, the additional $200,000 added to workforce since the draft includes recommendations for two potential awards of $50,000 for regional cooperation on workforce programs and an additional $100,000 for significant regional needs. Uh, at a prior Commission meeting, the Commission noted that there may actually be different needs in each region and that targeting an equal amount of workforce funds for both regions uh, may not actually address specific needs in, those, in one region that may be uh, experiencing some significant needs. And so with those points as a general overview, let me just turn it over to Joe and then he will in turn turn it over to Jill. Thank you. Um, Throughout the fall, we held uh, six meetings with uh, the various uh, committees and subcommittees. Um, we had some fairly robust discussions with these groups on the proposed changes to the guidelines from previous years. Um, as John mentioned, one of the main areas of interest was the transportation construction grants as being a new program. It uh, tended to generate the most discussion. Um, all of the groups seemed to be uh, in support of using funds for construction grants. But we did have a, a number of discussions around the best way to implement this program. Um, again, the first item that John talked about was uh, we got one written comment and several verbal comments about the amount of money that we're putting towards that program. I think our thought was that we wanted to start this program small. Um, you know, we're, we're sort of at the very beginnings of this. Let's see how things go, and then we can ramp it up as we go along. But we did add that uh, additional language that allows us to, to bring that level up if there's demand and there's, uh, and there's uh, space within the overall cap established for each region. The second item with respect to that was um, the requirement for lo local matching funds and what percentage that should be. Uh, it was the consensus of the groups that we should encourage a significant match from the communities, but without establishing an exact percentage. And the argument for that was that, you know, the scale of the projects 
um, and their relation to direct casino impacts could vary and should be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so w we added language to the guidelines that emphasized that emphasized the significance of uh, matching funds and the extent to which the project mitigates casino-related traffic impacts will be strongly considered in the evaluation of proposals. Uh, we also discussed um, the possibility of having multi-year construction grants. Um, due to the complexities involved with community borrowing, uh, the Commission's inability to guarantee the availability of funds over multiple years, and the fact that this is our first foray into providing construction funds, it was decided to defer the consideration of multiple year grants to the next round of funding. Uh, one of our subcommittee members offered uh, to help us set up a meeting with bond council so that we can develop a better understanding of the intricacies of municipal bonding and how that could work within our framework. Um, in addition to that, and uh, that are in the guidelines, we've proposed uh, during the course of this year issuing a statement of interest um, to the nearby communities uh, to help determine you know, what types of casino-related multi-year construction projects might be under consideration in those communities. And in doing that, that will give us an idea of sort of what the universe of projects is and uh, you know, dollar values and so on. And that will help us in crafting our guidelines going forward for some of these larger um, transportation-related projects. Uh, some of the other things that we talked about at the meetings, um, we talked about the split of funds between Region A and Region B. And uh, there definitely is a consensus among the regions that the money should stay within the regions. Uh, we also talked about the rollover of funds within the region if they are underutilized. Again, all were in agreement that the funds should remain in the regions and that the rollover funds should be the first money used when, when um, awarding grants. Um, also, a few questions around you know, sort of how strong the nexus to the casino must be in order to obtain funds. And we reiterated what we've said multiple times is that while there certainly can be ancillary benefits that are not casino related, the project must address a, cas a, a casino related impact. Um, and there was also some uh, discussion about the allowance of, of administrative costs on workforce grants. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Jill um, to talk about workforce. Um, so, in addition um, to putting the guidelines out for public comment, I also sent the guidelines specifically to our workforce partners and other um, training entities. And um, we additionally met with the Workforce Skills Cabinet, um, the Undersecretaries of Labor and Workforce Development, Education, Housing and Economic Development and a representative from Commonwealth Corporation um, was there. And um, received feedback on the guidelines, um, very positive feedback. Um, one discussion point was leveraging and coordination of the public funding that might be available through um, Workforce Competitiveness Trust Fund the skills capital grants or um, the Department of Secondary Education, the ESOL or ABE program funding, um, Department of Higher Education grants. And so, um, you know, th that seems to be something that um, we can really emphasize this year and, and, and should to our potential applicants, especially in the areas around hospitality and culinary. Um, additionally, we did receive one comment from the Jobs Action Network um, as a result of this outreach, and um, uh, we appreciate that um, uh, response. Um, they, they have mentioned some activities to be included um, in the guidelines. Some of the activities that we believe are um, allowable um, as we have already funded um, some of these areas. So for example, um, 
uh, workforce development assistance such as resume preparation, interview practice, and career counseling as long as the applicant makes the strong connection to the casino or to the backfill opportunities in hospitality or culinary. Um, you know, um, there is um, one point um, that maybe changes the direction of the grant. Um, the retention assistance um, would be a departure from what we have currently funded. Um, and um, this connection um, is um, maybe attenuated. It's um, not sure that um, I would recommend going in this direction. Um, but uh, we certainly appreciate the feedback um, from these community organizations. Uh, and, um, and I think that would be it. Um, I think the message this time around is we um, really expect collaboration and we're encouraging collaboration um, between the um, organizations in the entire region and we've incentivized it as well. Thanks, Jill. So our goal for today is to determine if the commission feels comfortable publishing these guidelines or if it would like any more information on any of its components. Uh, as such, we welcome any questions you may have. Uh, if the commission approves the guidelines today, we would aim to get them posted uh, by sometime next week. Um, one thing, if the commission does authorize uh, the guidelines, we do ask that it gives us some flexibility on minor wording changes in the event that we see something that needs correction. So with that, uh, open for any questions. I, I first want to say, um, having the, the opportunity to serve as the commission's representative on these committees, um, it's, it's, uh, it was unique this year to see the, the involvement of the committee members. I mean, some of them have been giving up their time for now two or three years. Uh, the conversations are more um, detailed. They're more um, um, strategic. Um, even some of the new members that we've added, you know, kind of jumped in with both feet and gotten engaged. Um, so I credit you, John and Mary and, and Joe and Jill on, on kind of bringing those committees to kind of coalesce around their work and be engaged and be partners uh, with us on this effort. So um, kudos to all of you for helping to do that. Um, I want to just I want to talk uh, just briefly about workforce development and some of this is kind of in light of the conversation we had with the skills cabinet just this this past Monday night. Um, uh, in, in this doesn't necessarily need to be reflected in the change in the guidelines, but I would like to see it maybe built into the application. Um, I think it's time because we've been doing these, uh, this will be our fourth year of workforce development mm -hmm. grants. Um, I would like to see one, our applicants go back and have a conversation with our licensees and we can help convene that conversation if it's appropriate. Um, just to make sure that some ongoing workforce development needs are being considered by our applicants with respect to our licensees. Uh, we know in the past there has been uh, support for the gaming school out in Western Mass. Uh, we've not seen as much connection to the, the gaming school provider in Eastern Mass, uh, and yet we still know that there are dealer and uh, dealer positions that continue to go unfilled. Um, I think as we tie uh, some money to a demonstration of significant needs, uh, that obviously we need to see that our applicants are actually making that assessment by talking to the local employer community. Um, it shouldn't just be all based on projections or anecdotes, let's see that they're really having a conversation to demonstrate that significant need in the region. Um, Jill brought up an interesting point, again, that was shared with us uh, by the team at the Skills Cabinet talking about new training dollars that might be made available. 
um, again, not to necessarily change the guidelines, but if an applicant wants to demonstrate to us that they plan to pursue other available monies from other stakeholders, it'd be great for them to note that and that on the end, the end of the process, we might be open to trying to match some of those monies. Uh, I think it was two years ago we had really supportive, hard and fast cash matches from some of the communities surrounding Everett. Uh, I'd like to see if we can have an opportunity to get back to that point and have a bigger impact with our infusion of dollars. But um, again, I think some of that can be folded into the application, not necessarily change the guidelines as you've had them presented. Uh, Commissioner, I think those are excellent points, and uh, to the extent that they're not addressed in our application, we can specifically do so. Um, specifically, the question regarding how are they working uh, with our current licensees, we can include a section on, in the application saying, can you please describe uh, the contents of your conversation regarding this application with the, with the um, uh, licensee. Uh, annually, as part of our, our reviews, we always reach out to the licensees to see what their opinions are about all of the applications, but sometimes the comments are more general in nature and they don't really give us the benefit of, of uh, the, the true conversation that happened. But asking the applicants to do that as part of the application, I think makes a good deal of sense in addition to uh, spelling out some of the matching funds and the other uh, things that you described. So sure. I think that's a, those are great suggestions. And I think we can um, certainly add a question about um, their discussions with regional employers as well. So, yeah. I th again, if if we're, and I like this idea of making an extra hundred thousand dollars available to address sig re significant regional needs, they got to be able to back that up somehow, right? And it's either through data or it's conversation with their, you know, the employers in the region. Um, you know, they got to have something to be able to demonstrate there's a significant need in the region still. It would be good to have it up front because, as you know, with our process, we bring in all the applicants for, for conversations and then we have pretty lengthy uh, follow-up questions and get detailed responses. But to have that from the start would actually be uh, beneficial to, I think, them and to us in right. part of the review. It gives them some time to do it before the application deadline. Right. And even beyond that, gives them time to be prepared for that when you do have those one-on-one -on -one visits. That makes a lot of sense. I just um, wanted to, uh, I concur with uh, Commissioner Stebbins that um, your use of committees is just, there's no better example here at the Commission uh, of it working so effectively. How much input, how much time they provide to this, not only with the guidelines, but I know on the review end as well when the applications are, are submitted. So I, um, and, and you know, you're just thoughtful about uh, tweaking the application because every year the needs change. So you're very, your group is really um, thoughtful about making those changes, really listening to um, the stakeholders. And um, so once again, I'm, I'm really impressed with the, the work that's done up front to, to make these the strongest guidelines possible. The other thing I think that is noteworthy is no guidelines are guidelines, but how hard the team works to make sure um, the applicants understand and are submitting exactly what you need to give them a fair shake. I know how much work goes in there as well. Um, they know they can pick up the phone or send an email and get a quick response. So I just, uh, you know, certainly am supportive of the changes you've made this year and you've laid them out well. So thanks for the, the work up front. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. One thing I wanted to mention, as I couldn't agree more, we continue to get more and more input, as Commissioner Stebbins uh, mentioned, some really valuable input. And it's, you know, sometimes we even joke in the meetings how uh, even if a staff member might have a different opinion from the, the community member, mm -hmm. the community member is winning these arguments lately. Mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, wow. uh, <laughs> much to staff member chagrin, but, uh, <laughs> that's but, funny. but that's okay. But uh, one thing I wanted to mention, in the guidelines, I didn't mention in my brief overview, um, as you recall, we have public safety grants and we put, place some limitations on public safety grants. And there was a, a figure that was left out of the initial draft of should there be an overall limit 
on the amount of uh, public safety grants for this next year. And we did put a $200,000 marker in there mm -hmm. per grant. But again, that is waivable based, based upon cause in the, in the And guidelines. we've already done that once before. Yes. Mm -hmm. I have a, a oh no, I'm just saying it looks good. It does look good. Um, I just have a, a couple of um, of questions or comments um, on this. I think that did you say for just next year you're going to solicit statement of interest with respect to the um, multiple year joint transportation and be like to just gather interest, but we won't be funding any of. Uh, that's correct. So the plan is that sometime in the uh, in the new year, you know, perhaps by May or so, if, if things work out, we would issue a request for statement of interest, and that wouldn't be a funding round. The funding rounds only occur on the the date, the February first date. But what that would do is that we would get the the we would learn about what projects are out there that would require multiple years of funding. Yep. That would help us build the guidelines for the future year mm -hmm. and would help us uh, learn more about the specific applications that might be before us in the future year. Um, you, you never want one project that we have talked about in some of the meetings is there's the pedestrian bridge uh, that has mm -hmm. been discussed. And I think in some of the conversations that we've had in the regional meetings is that uh, based on where that project stands right now, uh, actual construction dollars may not be necessary for, for next year. And uh, that project is rather complicated, so it could just need, need special legislation. So if something moves on that project, um, uh, we could certainly have conversations between now and next year. Uh, but I wouldn't anticipate that actual funding would be necessary um, to come out of the fund for construction dollars within this next fiscal year. But we may be back before the commission if uh, things develop on that project. And <clears throat> One point you mentioned was the difficulty in the bonding issues. Yes. Is there, um, are we able to do any outreach during the course of the next year to find out if there's innovation out there with respect to bonding that we might be, might not be aware of? I don't know if we've solicited public comment for that or if we're able to get any expertise. Yeah, uh, Joe mentioned that uh, one of our uh, subcommittee members uh, recommended a couple of names uh, of bond council that we can talk and to we can use about them. some innovation. So we will talk to them just as a purely informational basis. Yeah. Okay. Um, in addition, uh, I think we would rely upon if a municipality has a project that they want to move forward, they have yeah. some resources as well, some mm -hmm. council that they, they can take a look at some of the issues. So. Right. Uh, I was just wondering if there was an opportunity, and and I thought I had understood about the bond council to the extent that we can provide that education to municipalities who might be skittish or, or not have the immediate resources to look into it. Yep. yep. There might be innovations out there, so. Yeah, and I think we want to just understand sort of what the nuances are of how we could use our money to help, you know, pay debt service on loans taken out by a community. It's a little bit of a, a little more unorthodox arrangement right. than typical. Mm -hmm. That's so right. So we want to understand, A, if it's doable, and B, if it is, what we would have to do to make that happen and, and sort of what mechanisms we'd need to put in place. Yeah, I wasn't sure if I understood you correctly, so we would we can go ahead and do that outreach. Okay, as we will do away. that, yeah. That's excellent. Yep. And then secondly, with respect to outreach, we want to get uh, the, the wide universe of, of interest and applications. Right. Our communications director, that would be Elaine Driscoll, um, works closely with you in terms of advertising this wonderful program. That's right. So folks should stay tuned and watch our website and on these opportunities. That's good. Because we want, um, we want lots of applicants. So, and then finally, uh, John, I've mentioned this in the past. Y your leadership on this effort, is, as Commissioner Cameron has mentioned, is, is just outstanding. Thank and you. it is a program that, you know, really could be replicated uh, across the Commonwealth. So, at a certain point in time, when you have nothing else to do. We should think about how um, you could almost, um, you know, bundle this for a, te a template uh, for others uh, because it's outstanding work. Thank you. I mean, this team is just tremendously outstanding, and uh, kudos go go specifically to Mary. Um, for the last month, we've been torturing poor Mary on all of these figures on these reserves, 
uh, every single day. And um, uh, I guess I apologize. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Duly noted, Mary. <laughs> And thank that, you. And that's project manager Mary Thurlow. Thank you. We know we know exactly how much you provide uh, behind the scenes and and here in front of us. So thank you. Great work. Any other questions? No, Madam Chair, I move that the uh, the commission approve the final community mitigation fund guidelines for the 2020 community mitigation fund applications. Second. All those in favor. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Four zero. Excellent. Thank you all. Nice work. Thank you very much, team. Okay, commissioners, uh, we're going to move on to the next item, which is a, a, a letter that's in your packet. I believe Alex is going to take a seat. Welcome back, Dr. Walt Lightbaum. Uh, so, commissioners, in your packet is a letter for your consideration that has been drafted to be sent to the Speaker, the Senate President, and the Chairs of the Consumer Protection and Professional Licensure Committee uh, relative to the upcoming expiration of the Commonwealth's racing and simulcasting laws. Uh, as the Commission is aware, this past summer, the Legislature and the Governor signed an extension of these laws, which were due to expire on July 31st. Uh, pursuant to Chapter 47 of the Acts of 2019, these laws were extended to January 15th, 2020. Because this January 15th date uh, is soon approaching, we recommend that the Commission submit a letter expressing its support for a further time-limited extension of the current racing and simulcasting statutes as the Legislature contemplates why there or what larger reforms are warranted for the industry. Uh, as the Commission is aware, the Commission filed legislation regarding racing for, considera for consideration during this legislative session. At the November 21st Commission meeting, the Commission discussed this legislation, a Commission openness to review provisions of this legislation, and other legislation that has been filed regarding racing. Uh, I won't attempt to repeat that conversation. However, I will note that the proposals put forward in some of those pieces of legislation are likely to require some significant review by the legislature. Although a major reform of the Commonwealth's racing and simulcasting statutes is not impossible in the time between now and January 15th, enactment of a major reform by that time would certainly be challenging. Uh, for one reason, as the Commission is aware, the legislature concluded its, its planned formal sessions for the year um, back at the end of November. And formal sessions are not expected to resume until after the legislature reconvenes in the new year. Uh, the drop letter in your packet has been uh, drafted mindful of these time and logistical constraints. While we know that the legislature is aware of the upcoming deadline, we believe that the letter would be beneficial to respectfully express the commission's support for a further extension. The letter also extends an offer of any commission input that could be helpful in any larger review of the racing and simulcasting laws. We hope that these two components of the letter demonstrate the, com the commission's support for the legislature as it contemplates how to ensure that this important industry is not disrupted after the new year. Uh, we do note uh, that the draft letter ant anticipates a discussion by the commission about whether or not it wants to recommend how long an extension could be. Uh, I further note that even in the absence of any specific date, the legislature does face another internal deadline of J uh, July 31st, uh, 2020, which is the last day for formal sessions uh, for the uh, 191st General Court. Uh, Director Lightbound is here to help answer any questions you may have. And um, with that, I turn it over to the Commission. Uh, I, for one, I, I was impressed with the letter, John. Um, I know you and Alex and other folks worked on it, um, and I've given you, you know, some thoughts on kind of a first version that floated around. Um, another kind of quick edit on the first paragraph, the end of the first paragraph on page two. Uh, the last sentence says, should such input be useful? Mm -hmm. um, I would strike that. I would suggest any input is useful and that 
uh, you know, we would welcome the opportunity to review those suge those suggestions and input. Um, I don't think it's a question of would it be useful. I think it all is useful. Um, the um, with respect to setting an expiration date or recommending an expiration date, um, as you pointed out to me, as you pointed out to us, the fact of what the legislative calendar looks like in 2020, and they're wrapping up official business uh, by July 31st, which would be midway almost through our racing season. Um, so I was originally thinking a date past that and maybe past the end of the year. But as we heard from Mr. Tuttle today, there might be action on Beacon Hill with respect to sports betting and how sports betting might tie in racing, you know, before the July 31st uh, deadline uh, or kind of legislative deadline next year. Um, I don't know. I don't know where that leaves us in terms of making a recommendation as to an extension. Uh, you know, whether we set it for July 31st. So you, you see the language in the first paragraph. It, the question is whether we actually want to supply a date um, or leave it where the sentence would conclude after the word date. My recommendation would be to leave it to the legislature's I agree. discretion. I agree. Yeah. No sense putting a date in. I think it's going to be up to them. It's just a reminder letter mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, well, things happen if no action is taken. So I think my, my memory of the purpose of the letter was twofold. One was reminding, you know, sort of a general reminder of the January 15th. And then the other was more, um, an, a more forceful reminder that maybe it's time to look at this, you know, holistically and make decisions on where to go for the industry. Right. And I talked, Dr. Lightbound and I talked about a couple of the comments that I had on the letter, which is, and, and maybe we don't want to do this, but the comments I have speak more to drawing that point out, which is um, pointing out the number of times that this has only been extended as a stopgap rather than addressed substantively. Pointing out sort of the, the negative impact that can have on the industry in terms of the uncertainty. Um, that's a question it would speak to not putting a specific date on because it would speak to sort of encouraging them to really take a look at and decide how much time they would need to extend to then accomplish, you know, a, a deeper dive on what the statute should look like. Um, in terms of suggested edits, um, it's toward the end of the second paragraph on the first page, that last sentence that talks about, it says, thus a temporary shutdown would affect the funding available. Um, maybe to emphasize, say, thus even a temporary shutdown, to emphasize that even these sort of short-term disruptions and shutdowns can have a, a negative impact. Um, and then in the second page, the concluding paragraph, where you talk about how there have been um, examples of success in the industry. Dr. Leibon and I talked about getting the stat on um, my memory uh, was there was a presentation on the number of mass bred, uh, mass born foals and how that had gone up significantly given what has been in place. Um, and I don't know if that's possible to get um, a hard figure in terms of, I know there was some example, they did a number of years of how that had really gone up exponentially in showing the success of the program. I have some, um, some figures on the number of standard bred brood mares that mm -hmm. were in the state for, um, you know, from 2015 um, and then in 2019 where, you know, that uh, tripled basically. Right. So that was I thought that might be a, a one or two sentences in there to point yeah. to another example of a concrete um, improvement in the industry or benefit, economic benefit. Yeah. As, as many notes as we can take around the standard bread industry and the vibrancy that's been right. returned to the standard bread in industry, I think is extremely helpful. I think this is, I think we all agree this is how the legislature, when they passed the Gaming Act, was hoping Right. Know, the mm -hmm. contributions and the arrangements would work. Yeah. But this kind of lurching from deadline to deadline, I mean, I can't think of another industry in Massachusetts mm -hmm. which faces a deadline mm -hmm. as to how they're going to, whether they're going to be able to operate the next day. But do we want to try no, and I, tell them how many times? I, no, I, that's why I threw that out there is more, it could go either way. But I right. did want there to be yeah. another message in terms of it is yeah. also, we also think ripe 
to look at this substantively um, and reminders about the fact that we already have evidence of success, I think would help in that regard. Yeah. To your point, uh, Commissioner O'Brien, about the, the uncertainty that it creates, do you want to add a clause on that last sentence, even a temporary shutdown would affect the funding available for it to regulate the industry once it resumes, comma, um, creating continued um, uncertainty for the, something like that right. there, right. For, uh, uncertainty. Um, I don't think it's probably lost on the legislature that, that they use this mechanism mm -hmm. of extending the deadline. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's helpful for us to provide the reminder. Mm -hmm. And I would probably not recommend uh, going back uh, <clears throat> and counting them up. But I, I do think this is a helpful letter to, to just say. January 15th is coming around the corner because, as mm -hmm. John points out, they're in informal session, the holidays come up, and like everybody else, they're busy, and we don't want them to, at the last second, um, forget that there, there are some significant implications if an extension isn't in place. Madam Chair, I want to point out that there was one number that was included in the final paragraph that Alex and I caught uh, today. Um, the number of race days this mm -hmm. year was not 110, it was 108. Yes, next year will be one. Next year will be 110. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I really like one the idea. for this year. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And I really like the idea of, of putting in a couple lines about the successes of standard bread and hopefully they can extra extrapolate and think, okay, it would be possible to do that with, with thoroughbred as well, right? So uh, why don't uh, Alex and I try to find a sentence or two, and then we can recirculate the letter. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. I, th I think this thank really you. responds to our request, and thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Great work. Now, back to Director Griffin. Director Griffin, please, on um, item now, item number nine, our earlier item eight on the workforce supplier <coughs> diversity RFR for small business technical assistance. Good afternoon, good afternoon, commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. Nice to see you again. Um, commissioners, as you are well aware, the Expanded Gaming Act was an economic development bill whose intentions were to ensure that Massachusetts residents um, and businesses benefited both from the jobs and procurement opportunities provided by the new industry. Um, working with licensees, vendors, and community leaders, the commission ensures that the, new state, that the state's new industry is inclusive and provides opportunities that reflect the diversity of the Commonwealth. Um, licensees were required to set hiring goals and submit strategy plans for utilizing minority <coughs> women and veterans in the construction and operations of their gaming establishments. Um, the Workforce Supplier and Diversity Development Department is tasked with aiding and monitoring the licensees through these phases. Um, but with additional focus on the operations phase of the casino, um, the uh, commission has a mission to maximize the equity and inclusion um, and opportunities for local businesses looking to do work with the casinos as a vendor or a supplier. Um, we are seeing evidence of the intended impact and we want to ensure that the commission does everything possible to work with our licensees to maximize these results. So with that express purpose of ensuring that Massachusetts small businesses continue to be successful in the expanded gaming industry, um, we have posted a request <coughs> for responses um, is available as part of the public bid record on combis. Um, we did this on December 3rd, earlier this, this week. That's www.combuys.com. Um, the commission intends this grant program to provide targeted 
intensive one-on-one -on -one consulting expertise to small and medium-sized Massachusetts-based companies who are current vendors to one of the three casinos or a company that is identified by a casino as a potential vendor. Um, business technical assistance um, could include designing and executing um, business growth strategies, providing technical expertise around finance, capital management, human resources, back office infrastructure, uh, legal, uh, and other operational efficiencies. Um, the grant program is intended um, to fund a qualifying a business, uh, to fund a business assistance entity um, which can achieve the following objectives. Offering technical assistance to companies that have existing business relationships, as I mentioned, um, but may need consulting or technical assistance on a specific issue to ensure continued success as a vendor. Um, also working with um, the casino procurement representatives to identify Massachusetts-based and minority women and veteran business enterprise businesses in the procurement categories identified as needed by the licensees. Um, the commission may award grants totaling $150,000 in the competitive process to support um, these focus, uh, work focuses. We expect grant amounts to range from approximately $25,000 to $150,000. Um, you know, the grant funds must be expended by the end of the fiscal year, June 30th, 2020 but may be eligible for additional funding cycles based on performance and budget availability. Um, um, we are asking um, applicants to demonstrate that they currently operate a business technical assistance program, um, a grant program, and they can they need to demonstrate that um, they have existing infrastructure um, and recent indicators of success with business clients. Um, we are um, proposals are due on Friday, January third, by three p.m. and. Um, with that, I'll ask um, if you have any further questions. Director Griffin, on, just on your very last point, I'm yeah. wondering about the due date. Yes. January 3rd. <laughs> Did, uh, you've offered four weeks because you posted December 3rd. I'm wondering if you might want to extend it out another week given the holidays. You might um, lose some applicants because of just scheduling demands. Did you consider that? Possibly. We actually had an earlier date planned um, and extended it to the third, but we could, we could certainly consider it. Um, we think... Because you really want to turn it around fast. We do. Just um, the funds need to be spent by the end of end the fiscal, of fiscal year, year, so we're um, concerned about that timeline as well. Yeah, I, it is. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say it is a good point. I don't know that people focus as much um, until after the, the first of the year. I'm, not, I'm just not sure. Well, you could give them to Monday or Tuesday, not a whole week. You could at least give them into the beginning of the business week, the next business week. What's the difference? <laughs> we, um, <laughs> we we could we could certainly do that. We um, our legal um, advice. Um, uh, I think in, in the RFR, we have um, the ability to amend the, mm -hmm. you know, so, so we could certainly do that. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is, I think this is spot on, Jill, and kudos to you and, and your team, which kind of just includes you and Crystal, but um, 
I, I think your entire you're team. <laughs> well, your entire team. But, it, but I think this is interesting, kind of where this has evolved, is that you know, I think from the experience that you've had and the calls you've gotten, you're finding some individual vendors that have specific issues they're trying to get over. And it's a way to help our licensees not lose an opportunity to have a, a vendor relationship. Um, I think this is spot on. Um, to take note of kind of the tight time frame, are there conversations you can start to have with our licensees to get them to think about the companies they m might want to suggest uh, mm -hmm. would be good candidates for assistance, just to kind of mm -hmm. tee up some of this work? I've had initial conversations with all of the licensees to introduce and and, um, and really ascertain if this would be um, helpful. Um, and they each, each of the licensees came up with um, at least a handful of companies that could potentially um, be aided from this program. Okay. But I will certainly continue those conversations. Okay, great. Great, really good work. Hmm. And you don't need a vote to move I, forward. I don't need a Our vote. Bar is posted. So moving on, then any further questions for Director Griffin? So um, we will look at changing or extending the date to the following week, maybe. Yeah, yeah think about Monday. it. Think about it. I, I suspect what maybe um, um, Mr. Grossman is thinking is that see how your responses look and, and what you know whether you're getting them in and. But, um, but I just think it might be, uh, people might be right on the ball and getting it done before the holidays, but just that third, because the first would be a day off for most people, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Wednesday. that's the, that would be Wednesday. Wednesday, Wednesday. And then I suppose then they go back to work Thursday, Friday. You know, or if they so. have the week off, Monday would be right. appropriate, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So, just a thought. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> we want we want to make maximize the opportunity. So it's a great proposal. So thank you. Anything else? Excellent. As I mentioned, thank uh, you, thank you, Jill. As I mentioned, Commissioner Zuniga is not here, so we will not be going over the draft that is included in today's materials. Um, for the Gaming Commission's 2019 annual report. We'll take that up at our next public meeting. Um, with respect to item 11, one I had, but it was relevant to Commissioner Zuniga, so I won't be bringing that up. Do you have any? <laughs> <laughs> Using my brain. Um, any any uh, updates? No. Okay. No. Then, barring no further business, do I have a motion? Second. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Four zero. Thank you.